All right, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to the World Engineering Day featuring Charles Rund, Distinguished Global Lectures. I'd like to take this time to let you know, please do keep your phones on silent mode. All right, a very, very, very good morning to Madam Rahayu Mazam, Senior Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Law. Mr. Dawson Chung, President of the Institution of Engineers Singapore. Mr. So Wai Wa, Principal and CEO of Singapore Polytechnic. Mr. Danny Lee, Chairman of the Charles Rudd Distinguished Global Lectures 2024. Keynote speakers, panelists, special guests and partners of IES and SP. Guests joining us online from all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the World Engineering Day featuring Charles Rudd Distinguished Global Lectures. 2024. My name is Ajay and it is my absolute pleasure to be your host this morning. Jointly organized by the Institution of Engineers Singapore, Singapore Polytechnic and the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, this lecture this year marks a monumental evolution from a regional event into a global platform uniting international experts and audiences to highlight the importance of sharing innovative solutions and fostering collaborative efforts to address challenges faced on a global scale. Now, today's lecture is focused on sustainable development goals, engineering as an enabler. It will address four key areas, sustainable living, green economy, energy reset, and resilient future. It will highlight the critical role that engineering plays in advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Through a wide range of activities and initiatives outlined in the Singapore Green Plan 2030. Now this multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder approach of engineering, along with problem-solving capabilities, commitment to innovation, will make it that crucial enabler in the global pursuit of sustainable development and the achievement of these SDGs. Now before we go into the lecture proper, I'd also like to take this time to thank our sponsor, WeHur Holdings, and many of our supporting partners for making this event possible. Let's give them a big round of applause. Now, we're also very pleased to share that we have about a thousand of you in attendance here for this World Engineering Day and more than 140 joining us online from all over the world. Now, I'm also pleased to share that this event is organized in accordance with the MSE guidelines for organizing events. So we've adopted paperless registration and ensured there's no disposable cutlery used or crockery used for this entire program. So these are the some small steps that we can all take to contribute and support our sustainable development goals. Now, without further ado, let's commence the lecture. So, I'd like to invite Mr. So Wai Wa, Principal and Chief Executive Officer of Singapore Polytechnic, on stage for the welcome address. Mr. So, please. Madam, Rahayu Mazam, the Senior Power Sec from the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Law. Her Excellency, Ms. Kara Owen, the British uh, High Commissioner to the Singapore. Uh, Mr. Delson Chung, the President of the Institute of Engineers Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good morning and warm welcome to Singapore Polytechnic, or SP for short. I feel privileged that uh, for the second year in a row, uh, SP has the honor of collaborating with IES uh, to host this annual, very prestigious uh, Charles Root Lecture Series. Uh, it underscores the close relationship between IES and SP, and I believe between IES and the Polytechnic Fraternity in general. I thank IES for this collaboration that has benefited SP a lot, and I dare say it probably has benefited IES as well. 
Another example of this close collaboration is the work that IES does with SP as well as with other polytechnics and universities. We together offer micro-credentials, for instance, on sustainable engineering. So SP has mapped out our relevant courses on sustainability competencies identified by IES. And through these courses, this will allow engineers who undergo the training towards the award of Chartered Engineers in Sustainability under the auspices of IES. Our collaboration with IES is a reflection of how SP views partnerships. It is a key strategy in our response to the climate change challenge, which itself is a global problem affecting everyone. So really, we should all work together to deal with this challenge. So we've partnered with various agencies besides IES working on all fronts. For instance, we have been appointed by BCA, the Building and Control Authority in Singapore, to conduct its Sustainability in Singapore program. This program seeks to help SMEs to conduct engaging campaigns among their staff to promote a change in their behaviour towards more sustainable practices. We are also working with KPMG to offer a slew of C-suite courses targeted at SMEs on the matter of sustainability. With ASTAR, we have working with them to extend their Green Compass 2. The Green Compass 2 is a development by ASTAR is an innovative environmental sustainability assessment tool. And with this tool, SP will assist SME to gauge their current state of readiness and chart a course towards sustainable practices. And lastly, I will mention our collaboration with Downforce and Grundforce, two Danish companies. Together, we organize a best-in-class in environmental sustainability and energy efficiency program. This is a nine-day program. It brings C-suites from SMEs in Singapore to Denmark to explore firsthand the sustainability and innovative technologies that drive decarbonisation there. Denmark is one of the world's uh, leading countries in sustainability. The inaugural run was conducted in September last year, and the next one is scheduled for June this year. In fact, last year, at this lecture, when it was conducted at this same location, I had to give a welcome address via a pre-recorded video. And that was because at that time of the event, I was on a plane to Denmark uh, to lay the groundwork for this uh, nine-day program uh, that saw the inaugural run in September uh, last year. At that welcome address, I reminded everyone that the country has set a goal of uh, net zero emissions in 2050. And the government has set a goal for public agencies like SP that we should be net zero around 2045. So last year at this lecture series, I said as an education institution, Singapore Polytechnic should do more. We should aspire to reach net zero before 2045. Now, some in the audience that day might not have taken the statement too seriously. After all, uh, who will be around in 2045 to fulfill that commitment? And when we hear the government setting a goal of 2045, it may appear to be a distant goal, something to be pursued perhaps by the next generation. I'm proud to say today, as a follow-up to that commitment that I made last year, SP has now uh, gone on to conduct a sustainability study. Uh, KPMG was a consultant which was uh, very helpful in this respect. And following the study, we are now able to say we will do more than half the work in less than half the time. Specifically, we are able to declare that we have a 60-30 vision. By the year 2030, 
SP will decarbonize by 60% using our FY2022 emissions as a, bench, as a baseline. Now, uh, how is that possible? How are we able to set this 60-30 goal? As I said, uh, we've conducted a study using FY2022 as a baseline. We've counted the cost and we discovered that the necessary investment may actually pay themselves over time. That's because if electricity bills keep increasing, the savings from our more efficient uh, chillers and other uh, electrical appliances will actually fund the investment. In fact, we expect to break even in the year 2033 when we commence our plans in this year. I hope SP's uh, 6030 vision will inspire all of us to up our game in our journey towards net zero. Indeed, 2045 seems far away, but really I believe there's an urgency to take action now. Our generation, you and I, we have contributed much to the pollution uh, that's going on and the climate warming uh, and global warming that's going on. And so really it falls on us to take action now rather than to kick the can down the road and expect our children and those who come after us to pick up our mess. So really, uh, we should take action. And SP study has shown that there are projects that can reduce our emission significantly and even pay themselves through cost avoidance. What SP has shown is it is possible to do more than half the work in less than half the time. I hope that through the exchanges today, we can inspire each other towards a world without carbon emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. So. Now, it's absolutely remarkable. This is the one thing I always enjoy listening to engineers share, because more than half the work in less than half the time is something everyone in every industry just is itching to hear. You know, getting more done with less. And that's a beautiful thing that engineers do. Finding ways to optimize, make things work much faster, more optimally with the resources you have on hand. And that's another beautiful thing Mr. So said. Starting today, instead of kicking that can down the road. So starting today, what can we do? And to see all of you here today and this beautiful venue, Singapore Polytechnic, with students that I can see in the back as well. So getting all of them involved here in this space is such a truly marvelous event and definitely a wonderful World Engineering Day and Lecture Series. Now, I'd like to invite next Mr. Dalson Chung, President of IES, on stage for his opening address. Mr. Dalson, please. Our guest of honor, Ms. Rahayu Mazam, Senior Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Law. Her Excellency Kara Owen, CMG CVO, British High Commissioner to Singapore. Mr. So Waiwa, Principal and CEO, Singapore Polytechnic. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Charles Rudd Distinguished Copa Lectures 2024. I'm pleased to announce that we have more than 1,000 participants from all over the world with us in person and online. Thank you for your support. This is the very first time the Institution of Engineers Singapore, or IES, is holding this lecture as a global event, signifying our commitment to working with the international community to address the major global challenges of our time. In doing so, we aim to advance the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, interconnected goals that depend on global collaboration efforts to be successful. Since 2007, IES has been organizing the Charles Rudd Distinguished Public Lectures to accumulate 
Engineer Charles Rudd's outstanding spirit of continuous professional development and lifelong learning. Engineer Rudd was a distinguished founder member and a fellow of IES who bequeathed Singapore dollar 1.23 million to IES. Over the years, we have the honour of having many illustrious speakers on the series, with the most recent being, held, being Mr. Ling Tuan Liang, the Government Chief Sustainability Officer, Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment. His Excellency Soyo Pradomo, the Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia, Her Excellency Ivono Pioko, the Ambassador of the European Union, and many more. Today, we are privileged to have our guest of honour, Ms. Rahayu Mazam, greeting our event and giving an address. Her Excellencies Kara Oven and Mr. Pang Sing Jian, Zone President East Asia Schneider Electric, as our two distinguished speakers and eminent experts, as our panelists. Thank you all your support in making our, grow, our goal of globalizing the Charles Rudd Lectures series a success. We have chosen Sustainable Development Goals Engineering as an enabler as the theme of this event to demonstrate the importance of engineering in driving progress in the key pillars of sustainable development, sustainable living, green economy, energy reset, and resilient future. The discussions today will focus on two topics, opportunities and challenges, energy reset and green economy moderator, and the approach to foster a resilient future and sustainable living moderator. These topics are in alignment with the COP28 UN Climate Change Conference held in Dubai at the end of last year. They emphasize the urgent need for sustainable practices and innovation to address the global climate crisis. That's what Mr. So has already said. Although the government has set a target for 2050 and the government agencies has committed to completing the goal by 2045, we can't wait until 2050 or 2045. The action must start now. And both based on some of the events that I've attended, they are complaining that we have been talking too much. What about action? We need to take actions now. Today's events also coincides with the World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development, or WED. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, has designated 4th March every year as the World Engineering Day to celebrate and acknowledge the contributions of engineering professionals worldwide. I hope you will enjoy the special WED 2024 video later, spotlighting Singapore's notable contributions towards developing a sustainable home for our residents. Advancing sustainable development through engineering has been a key focus of IES. Driven by the IES Green Plan 2030, an engineering-focused action plan designed to support the goals set in the Singapore Green Plan 2030. I'm pleased to announce that today we will be marking another new milestones in the IES Green Plan 2030 with the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding or MOU by IES and 11 Institutes of Higher Learning, IHLs. The MOU will amplify efforts in boosting engineering skills in sustainability through the creation of specialized training modules and assessments. Successful candidates will be eligible to apply for the IES Engineering Chartered Ship Certification in Sustainability, empowering the next generation of engineering trailblazers. I'm also proud to share another exciting development on the international front. Engineer Tan Sing Chuan, IES Emeritus President and World Federation of Engineering Organization, will feel president-elect has been involved or has been invited to represent Singapore at the UNESCO WED 2024 in Lisbon, Portugal. Thank you for flying the Singapore flag high on the global stage. Engineer Tan, your dedication is an inspiration to all of us to keep pushing the boundaries of engineering excellence. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to Singapore Polytechnic, SP, and the real field for jointly organizing this event with IES and to SP, for offering this exceptional venue. Special thanks to Professor Saram Ramakrishnan for moderating the panel discussions, and to Mr. Danny Lee, IES Vice President for External Relations and Chairman of the Charles Rudd Distinguished Global Lectures. 
his organizing committees and his team for their wonderful efforts in organizing this event. Thank you all again for joining us today. Let us continue to foster a community of like-minded individuals who will influence others to join us in making the dream of a sustainable Singapore a reality. I wish all of you a rewarding day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Now, what I absolutely adore about Mr. Delton is every time he comes on stage, he always tries to let you know that it's not only just about talking, it's about action. And he's already committed to you that today you will see action taking place right here on this stage with 11 institutes of higher learning working together with IES to achieve something incredible. Now, this is the one thing which I absolutely adore again as well about what IES does is partnerships with education. Because any change for the future starts with the youth today and to have them on board and the institutions that work with them working together to make sure that future by 2050, who is going to be there? The students who are sitting at the back right now. They're the ones who are going to be in charge. And to see them at the conception and to see them at the end of it will be something truly magnificent. On that note, it's my great pleasure to invite our guest of order, Madam Rahayu Mazam, Senior Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Law, on stage to address us. Madam Rahayu, please. Your Excellency, Ms. Kara Owen, British High Commissioner to Singapore, Mr. Delson Chung, President of the Institution of Engineers, Singapore IES. Mr. Danny Lee, Chairman of today's Charles Rudd Distinguished Global Lectures 2024 and Vice President of IES. Mr. So Wai Wa, Principal and CEO of Singapore Polytechnic. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to all of you here at the Singapore Polytechnic Convention Center. And for those tuning in from around the world, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Minister Edwin Tong sends his apologies that he is not able to join you today as he is needed in Parliament this morning. So he has asked me to speak to all of you. I am very happy to be here. Today is World Engineering Day, where we celebrate engineering and the contribution of engineers around the world. Indeed, engineers play a crucial role in society. They apply scientific problems or they apply scientific principles to solve real world problems driving progress and improving the quality of life for people around the world. Just looking at Singapore, engineers have played a significant role in transforming our nation from third world to first, be it in the infrastructure, social, economic or defence aspect. They helped to resolve many of our struggles post-independence. When Singapore gained independence in 1965, our people were living in kampongs, slums and squatters with deplorable living conditions. It was engineers who built our HDB flats with clean water and sanitary plumbing systems and high-speed telecommunication networks. Today, Singapore is one of the best places to live in the world. It was also engineers who helped to realise our economic strategies. They built our airport and seaport, which are now one of the best and busiest in the world and is expected to continue to be amongst the best and busiest with the upcoming Terminal 5, which is bigger than Terminals 1 to 4 combined, and the Tuas Megapod, which is double the current capacity. They supported our industrialization and economic strategies, which created good jobs for Singaporeans and improved their livelihoods. They reclaimed land for use, industrial use, for example, Jurong Island, where several islands were amalgamated into one huge island and is now the heart of our energy and chemicals industry and to us, which is now a leading pharmaceutical, manufacturing and biomedical sciences hub. Engineers were also central in solving some of our exigency issues, even turning them from our weaknesses to our strengths. One of them is our water crisis. As many of you would be aware, Singapore is one of the most water-stressed countries in the world due to lack of natural water resources and limited land available for water storage facilities. We had to import water from Malaysia. To secure water supply, we created man-made reservoirs. Marina Barrage, an iconic structure at the mouth of Marina Channel, is our 15th reservoir, the Marina Reservoir. We recycled wastewater. The older Singaporeans would remember the historic moment when 60,000 people toasted Singapore's birthday at the National Day Parade with bottles of new water. 
We treated seawater with this, through desalination. Not only did we solve our water crisis, we turned it into an opportunity. We started to export our know-how to other countries. We became recognised internationally for our water resources management capabilities. And we are now a global hydro hub with an ecosystem of more than 200 water companies and 25 water research centres. We could not have achieved all these without engineers. There are more challenges ahead of us which require engineers. One of them is sustainable development, the theme of this year's Charles Rudd Distinguished Global Lectures. This is an important topic for us as it has the potential to become a national crisis like the water crisis we faced years ago. Singapore is extremely vulnerable to the impact of climate change. We are one of the lowest lying countries in the world. About 30% of our island is less than 5 metres above sea level and most of Singapore are within 15 metres above sea level. Our highest elevation is only 164 metres. That's the peak of Bukit Timah Hill. According to the updated projections from Singapore's third national climate change study released two months ago, mean sea level will rise up by up to 1.15 metres by 2100 and by up to 2 metres by 2150 under the worst case scenario. Extreme weather events such as high tides and storm, storm surges are likely to cause levels to spike by a further 4 to 5 metres. Therefore, we need to move decisively now, and not only in 2100. Mr. So Waiwa and Mr. Dalson Chong both made the same point. We need to start now. We need to take action now. Over the years, we have put in place various measures to mitigate the impact of climate change, such as protecting 70 to 80 percent of our coastlines by constructing seawalls and stone embankments, reducing our carbon emissions by investing in green buildings and public transport system, switching to cleaner energy sources such as natural gas, hydrogen and solar, and recycling our waste and water. We are now building a polder in Pulau Tekong to protect the island from rising sea levels. A polder, and this definition is more for myself, is a reclaimed tract of land that lies below the surrounding sea level and is protected by a dike. It is then managed by a system for drainage canals and pumping stations which control the water levels within it. This new reclamation method of empoldering instead of infilling with sand reduces the amount of sand needed, thereby reaping savings on upfront construction costs. More recently, we announced a bold plan for a long island in the East Coast area. It comprises land reclaimed to a higher level off the coast in the form of islands located some distance away from the existing coastline. This creates a new reservoir, which not only form a line of defence against rising sea levels, but also provide a new source of water supply, like Marina Barrage. It also creates more land to meet future redevelopment needs, including for residential and recreational purposes. Around 100 billion Singapore dollars or more may be needed over the next century to protect Singapore against rising sea levels. We are able to do so because the government thinks long term and not for the next one, two or three political cycles. We have responsible and sustainable budget and reserve accumulation policies which allow us to spend in key areas to benefit not just the present generation but also future generations. As our Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong said in his budget speech three weeks ago, many countries find it hard to implement bold and long-term plans, but we can make it happen in Singapore. We are able to do so because our fiscal position is healthy and sustainable, our government has the trust of Singaporeans, our people are united and our social compact is strong. Everyone has a role to play in our long fight against climate change. I am heartened to see different groups and individuals stepping up. SP, for example, has embarked on several sustainability initiatives, such as requiring all students to undertake a sustainability innovation project, rolling out programs to promote behavioural change and equipping businesses with the knowledge and skills to navigate the complexities of sustainable practices and the decarbonisation journey. Engineers in particular have an outsized role. We need engineers to conduct research on new green technologies and solutions, design sustainable infrastructure including buildings, transportation systems, water and sanitation facilities, energy systems and waste management systems. Build resilient infrastructure including flood protection systems and coastal defence, 
optimize processes to improve resource efficiency, reduce waste and minimize environmental footprint, and implement environmental restoration projects, habitat conservation plans, and ecosystem management strategies. To meet expected demand for engineers trained in sustainability, IES will be signing an MOU with 11 of our autonomous universities and polytechnics to develop training course modules and assessments for engineers. Engineers who completed and passed the required modules and assessments may register for the IES Engineering Chartership Certification in Sustainability Sector. Upon successful completion of a report and panel interview by IES, they will be accredited a chartered engineer in sustainability, as accredited as a chartered engineer in sustainability, which validates that they have the technical skills and competencies in line with global industry standards. This is just one of the latest initiatives by IES, who has been doing a great job since its establishment in 1966 to advance the engineering profession in Singapore. As with many professions, continual upgrading is necessary to ensure that your knowledge and skills remain relevant. Besides formal courses, conferences and lectures like today, where leading experts, innovators and thought leaders among the global engineering community come together to discuss engineering challenges and emerging technologies to address these challenges. These are all very, very helpful. I would encourage all of you to make use of the opportunity to network and interact among yourselves. I've always found it useful as a lawyer to be able to pick up the phone, call other lawyers whenever I encounter an issue. Sometimes you just need someone to point you in the correct direction. So look out for new friends today and build that network. There is no shortage of demand for good engineers. The world needs more engineers. Singapore needs more engineers. So I hope all of you will stay the course and remain in this field. And as importantly, transfer your knowledge, skills and experiences to your younger colleagues, just like how your seniors did the same with you. We can continually improve and reach greater heights by having each generation stand on the shoulders of the last generation. On this note, I wish all of you, past, current and aspiring engineers, a happy World Engineering Day. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Rahayu. I'd like to invite you to remain on stage. There's a very powerful point by Madam Rahayu on networking. A lot of times, even in her story when she shared at the start, Singapore's growth from the 1960s all the way into now, and even since before that into now, it has been with the help of an international community of engineers. Today we stand shoulder to shoulder almost with this international community and that power of networking will be what helps us go into that next level helping other countries helping other countries in the region and beyond sharing what we know and what we have learned now since the launch now as madam rohayu mentioned and as mr dalson mentioned we have a very special mou that we will be signing today since the launch of the Sustainable Singapore Blueprint in 2009, the sustainability sector in Singapore has grown significantly over the past decade and the country has established itself as a hub for sustainable development in the Asia-Pacific region. Now, the sustainability sector in Singapore is projected to continue growing in the coming years, driven by our commitment to sustainability and the growing demand for sustainable solutions in the region. Now, recognizing that sustainability is a relatively nascent area among the local engineering community, IES and 11 of our institutes of higher learning will be signing an MOU to work together to upskill engineers' competencies in sustainability and relevant sectors. So let's welcome on stage, first, Mr. Dalson Chung, President of IES, and Mr. So Waiwa, Principal and CEO of SP. Next, let's welcome the signatories on stage in alphabetical order. I'd like to, in, in alphabetical order of the Institutes of Higher Learning, I'd like to first welcome Ms. Jeannie Liu, Principal and CEO of Republic Polytechnic. Mr. Lim Kok Kiang, Principal and CEO of Neon Polytechnic. Professor Go Yang Miang, Assistant Dean, Office of Research and Industry, College of Design and Engineering, National University of Singapore. 
Professor Jin Sui Chuan, Associate Vice President, Continuing Education, Nanyang Technological University. Mr. Russell Chan, Principal and CEO, Nanyang Polytechnic. Associate Professor Forrest Tan, Provost, Singapore Institute of Technology. Professor Gary Tan, Academic Director, Lifelong Learning, Academic Director, Industry Practice Masters, Singapore Management University. Associate Professor Alan Chia, Assistant Provost, External Relations and CET, Singapore University of Social Sciences. Professor Erwin Viray, Chief Sustainability Officer, Singapore University of Technology and Design. And Mr. Peter Lam, Principal and CEO, Tamasek Polytechnic. All right, so now under this uh, MOU, the IHLs will develop training course modules and assessments to support the registration process for the IES Engineering Chartership Certification in Sustainability and Relevant Sectors. Now, to officiate this signing of the MOU, for all our guests on stage, now you have a very, very special pad with you. Now, we're going completely digital, so it has your logo on it and this beautiful World Engineering Day logo and banner on it as well. So hold it to you hold it to your chest when i count to three we're all going to show so flip it out so everyone can see your beautiful logos of your institutions and that would be the launch that is the symbolic launch and agreement that your institute is part of this collective effort so that's one two three and then on the three everyone just flips it out together okay okay here we go so ladies and gentlemen on the count of three one two Three! Congratulations on the partnership! Now to ensure the movement is captured, we've taken a lot of great pictures. Thank you all. I'd like to invite you all back to your seats. I'd like to invite Madam Rohayu, Mr. Dalsen Chung, and Mr. So to please remain on stage. Now, Madam Rohayu, we'd like to present you with a token of our appreciation for joining us here today. I'd like to invite Mr. Dalson Chung and Mr. So Waiwa to present their tokens of appreciation. From Mr. So. Thank you all so much. I'd like to invite you back to your seats. Thank you. Today marks a special occasion. As we all gathered here to celebrate the Charles Grant Distinguished Global Lectures on World Engineering Day. To honor this meaningful day, we've curated a very special video tribute to commemorate the remarkable achievements and tireless dedication of our engineers in Singapore. I'd like to invite you to sit back, relax, and immerse yourselves in this inspiring journey through the realm of engineering excellence. A city where engineering meets innovation against a backdrop of a stunning skyline. In the face of urbanization and environmental challenges, engineers here strive for resilience, tackling issues like coastal protection, water scarcity, and transitioning away from fossil fuel. Singapore is committed to sustainable development, as outlined in initiatives like the Singapore Green Plan and the IES Green Plan. The plan was developed in alignment with the five key pillars of the Singapore Green Plan 2030, and they are City in Nature, Energy Reset, Sustainable Living, Green Economy and Resilient Future. Singapore has also been investing heavily in research and development of sustainable technologies. One remarkable project is the development of the floating solar farm, which maximizes land use by leveraging Singapore's abundant water bodies. Singapore is now home to one of the world's largest floating solar farms and it is capable of potentially offsetting more than 4,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Furthermore, Singapore has been at the forefront of sustainable urban planning, 
the creation of eco-friendly districts such as the Bongo Eco Town and Tenga, which showcase Singapore's commitment to creating environmentally conscious and livable communities through green spaces and smart infrastructure. Professional development is key, evident in events like the World Engineers Summit and the Charles Rudd Distinguished Public Lectures. PSA has undertaken to build the Tuas Port. When completed in 2040, it will be the world's largest automated container terminal with an annual handling capacity of 65 million TUs. PSA has also set a target for Tuasport to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The project has garnered two prestigious awards from Singapore Building Control Authority. First, the Green Building Innovation Cluster, and second, the Super Low Energy Building. IES Singapore and ASEAN has also awarded Tuas Maintenance Base for its outstanding engineering sustainability project in November last year. The Accelerated Catalyst Development Platform, or ACDP at ASTAR, is established to speed up the catalyst development for a wide range of applications. The platform uniquely integrates domain expertise such as machine learning, molecular modeling, and high-throughput automated experimentation. Sustainability is at the center of ASTAR. Complementary expertise put together in this project enables acceleration of catalyst discovery by five times and thus help us finding sustainable solutions quicker to reduce and utilize various waste. In less than a year, the project has achieved impressive advancements in developing low carbon solutions such as converting CO2 to sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, it has become an enabling technology for us for catalyst discovery that will contribute to net zero goals to make our world better. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish all engineers locally and across the globe a happy World Engineering Day. At this juncture, thank you for all your contributions of our local engineers in Singapore and beyond. I look forward to more contributions from all of you in building a greener and more sustainable future Singapore. Happy World Engineering Day! Happy World Engineering Day! Happy World Engineering Day! Let's give a big round of applause. The wonderful works of our engineers to reaffirm our commitment to driving innovation and progress for generations to come. We now move to our first distinguished keynote address of the 2024 IES Charles Roy Distinguished Global Lectures. It is my great pleasure to invite Her Excellency Cara Owen, British High Commissioner to Singapore on stage. Your Excellency, please. Thank you very much. Um, and it was wonderful to be here to hear the speeches of Madame Rahayu, Mr. So Wai Wa, and Mr. Dalson Chung, and also to be here witnessing this momentous uh, signature um, uh, to help upskill Singapore engineers into the future. Um, you might be wondering why a diplomat is speaking to a bunch of engineers. Uh, but I'm going to be sharing with you um, some thoughts uh, in my country about how we can make sure that we upskill the engineers that we need to take on um, the green economy challenge. Um, and also, I'm the daughter of a civil engineer. And I remember going to work with my father and being really excited by the projects that he was involved in, by the complexity, by the difficulty, sometimes by the kind of dirt and dust of being an engineer. And it's inspired me um, all the way through my career. Singapore, as Senior Parliamentary Secretary uh, Rahayu said, is a, it's a miraculous country. And it's built by miracles that engineers have thought of and put into place. If I think through my 
nearly five years here in Singapore, some of the most memorable moments are when I've confronted the reality of the um, innovation that has been required of engineers here in Singapore. Um, Madam Rahu mentioned Singapore's water story. It's impossible to understand how impressive Singapore is if you don't understand what Singapore has managed to achieve around its own water. And everywhere we see innovative um, engineering solutions. Um, I've also been really impressed by green engineering, green architecture within Singapore, and how um, Singapore architects and engineers are tapping back into um, uh, techniques that may have been known of by their forefathers um, to harness natural solutions uh, for better living, including keeping us cool. Um, I've also had the privilege of going to look at the engineering involved in building the North-South Corridor, uh, which one engineer who is in charge of one of the tunnels um, in Mott MacDonald told me that it was a bit like tunneling through toothpaste. Um, I don't think we should get terrified by that. I think it just shows how amazing the engineers are uh, that deliver these amazing projects. But today I'm going to be inspired by um, standing in Singapore Polytechnic. I'm going to be speaking about uh, skills. I'm going to talk a bit about what the UK is doing around skills and also um, introduce to you some of the collaboration between the UK and Singapore in the area of green economy and perhaps ask for you to accompany us on our partnership journey. I'm really proud that the UK uh, leads the world on net zero um, with the most ambitious 2030 target of any major economy and the fastest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the G7. Those emissions have gone down almost 50% since 1990. And this has happened at a time when we've also managed to grow our economy by 79% proving to the world that you can both decarbonize and grow at the same time. But there are still many, many hurdles ahead for the UK, uh, for Asia, and for the world in meeting our uh, climate targets. One of the most significant of these hurdles is a shortage of the skills and labor we need to deliver on our ambitions. The UK government's net zero and energy security objectives depend on the UK workforce having the right skills and capacity in the right locations across the whole of our country. In particular, decarbonisation across the UK economy will rely on engineering solutions and a skilled engineering workforce. Jobs in engineering and technology are growing at a faster rate than the average for all other professions, with potential for even faster growth if further investment is made towards net zero targets and carbon emissions. According to a recent report published by Engineering UK, around 25% of all jobs posted in the UK are in engineering and technology. However, this is set against a decline in the number of engineering technology apprentices over the last five years, and the numbers of students studying engineering technology subjects, although they're growing, um, in higher education are not increasing at a fast enough rate to meet our future needs. This combined with rapidly emerging new energy, uh, new roles related to green skills and technology advancements highlights the need for sustained and growing investment in training and reskilling and retraining those already in the labour market. This is particularly important for those where automation or emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence is likely to change the shape of their job. In fact, in the past five years, postings for green engineering jobs have increased by 55%, and those requiring green skills by 48%. A report by the Green Alliance in the UK estimates that 300,000 more skilled workers will be needed to green our buildings, while between 400,000 and 472,000 skilled workers will be needed to power the green economy. It's essential to invest in the skills of a more diverse range of new entrants to the engineering labor market. Only by improving workforce diversity and reaching the full pool of talent can the sector fill its skills and labor gaps. In this, I'm really admiring of Singapore, where I think you have done better than we have in ensuring gender diverse intakes into engineering uh, degrees. But luckily, there are some statistics that suggest uh, that we can be hopeful Green engineering and green energy are sectors that are more likely to attract female engineers 
than the more traditional counterparts. I think perhaps this is because there is a really strong sense of purpose to align um, with uh, use of technical skills. So it may be that we are on the cusp of changing uh, our situation with respect to women in science and tech. In, invest, in addition to investing in training, reskilling, and retraining both the future and existing engineering technology workforce, it's important also that clear strategies are developed to address regional challenges and the skills needed. There is a fabulous example of how this is being done in the northeast of England, and it also involves a uh, very well known Singapore company, Semcorp. Semcorp is based on a site of a former ICI plant. Um, in Teesside, um, uh, which is alongside a former massive steelworks, which has since been closed down. The whole of this area is being regenerated um, with the aim of being a net zero power generation plant um, in the years to come. And that opportunity, which involves a huge amount of um, investment from lots of international investors and from our own government and from regional government uh, in uh, Teesside, um, it's going to need a whole new range of skilled employees. And so the uh, companies, including Semcorp, that are based in that region are working very closely with the colleges of higher education and the local universities to make sure that the skills um, of the graduates that are produced in that region um, uh, meet the needs of the future employers. And this will allow those people to remain in place in the northeast of England in Teesside. Strengthening links between stakeholders, government, engineering companies and education providers will be absolutely critical and so too will be greater international collaboration giving both our population demographics and the changing skills mix result resulting from rapid development in emerging economies, particularly those in the Asia Pacific region. With the growth in demand for green skills and the central role engineer and technicians play in transitioning to a green economy and addressing climate change, ensuring that the sector has the skilled workforce needed to thrive is urgent. So how is the UK preparing for this shift? The UK government will publish a green jobs plan later this year. It will outline the actions and solutions being progressed to deliver the UK workforce needed to deliver net zero ambitions in our country. To ensure the plan is robust, we're actively engaging with industry, the devolved administrations, meaning Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and a wide range of other stakeholders. Last year, we set up specific task and finish groups for each priority sector where previous work had identified concerns. The sectors covered include power and networks, hydrogen and CCUS, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, heat and buildings, nature, waste, and recycling. Each task and finish group completed a workforce assessment, which are being analyzed to understand sectoral challenges and identify sectoral and cross-cutting interventions that industry and the governments of our four nations can take, and to inform a specific list of policy interventions to include in the Green Jobs Plan. We're also working hand in hand with um, Singapore government and local stakeholders here in Singapore on addressing the green skills shortage, particularly in the context of our green economy framework signed one year ago. This UK-Singapore framework focuses on both of our nation's natural strengths, such as our leading financial and transport hub prominence, so that we can partner together to enable both of our countries to decarbonize in alignment with the Paris Agreement, to enhance our energy security, and to promote green growth through new investment, job creation, and export opportunities. This will not only support the UK and Singapore in achieving their respective climate goals, but it will also create greener jobs. We have three pillars that we're focusing on. Low carbon energy technologies, such as hydrogen and carbon capture utilization and storage. Green transport, in particular, how to decarbonize maritime routes and scaling up sustainable aviation fuels. And carbon markets and sustainable finance, in particular, supporting the scale up of high integrity voluntary carbon markets. The UK and Singapore recognize that green skills development is integral to de delivering our ambition across all of these pillars. Late last year, at the G20 in New Delhi, the UK and Singapore Prime Ministers met and launched a new strategic partnership between our two countries. While we have always been very close, this is an elevation of our relationship, 
that sets the ambition for the next decade to come. This means that we now have a clear mandate at the Prime Minister level to do more together in the areas that matter most, including across our economy, climate and energy, research and innovation, and defence and security. On climate and energy, we specifically committed to establishing a new green skills corridor between the UK and Singapore to ensure that both of our economies are able to develop future-ready green workforces. To ensure this new corridor has a strong foundation, we're working with Arup, one of our engineering stars, to develop a UK-Singapore green skills roadmap based on an assessment of the UK and Singapore's current green skills supply, demand, and gaps. The work we've done together to date with Singapore and with our respective business and academic partners has contributed to a real sense of momentum in what our two governments can do to deliver ambitious outcomes for our people, for our economy and for our planet. I encourage all of you to join us in what we're trying to do together. Thanks to the collaborative efforts of engineers and policymakers, renewable energy sources have become significantly more affordable and efficient, surpassing even our wildest expectations. As we progress, batteries, energy storage technologies, and possibly even carbon capture technologies may follow a similar trajectory. While substantial work must be done on a global scale, each country, each state, and city must chart its own unique path forward from the array of available options, as Singapore has done. And all of this must unfold while ensuring that economies and our people thrive and prosper. Engineers are at the core of these endeavors. They play a pivotal role in crafting and implementing the solutions essential for our collective progress and in, um, and in rebuilding the trust built through collaboration that will make our imagination a reality. It's clear that the demand for green skills is only going to grow. To support their development, governments, industry and academic partners should be willing to work together and invest more in training of both the future and current work workforce. The MOU signed today is a real inspiration to us in that regard. Only by following initiatives like this will the UK and Singapore be able to achieve our own net zero emissions goals, maintain our ability to compete in a net zero world, and ensure our economic prosperity into the future. Thank you, and happy World Engineering Day. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. Now, we'd also like to take this time to present Her Excellency with a token of our appreciation. I'd like to invite Mr. Downson Chung, President of IES, and Mr. So Wai Wa, Principal and CEO of SP, on stage to present the tokens. Mr. Downson, Mr. So, please. Let's give another big round of applause for Her Excellency Kara Owen, British High Commissioner to Singapore. All right, let's take a moment to capture this momentous occasion with a group photo. Thank you all. You may return to your seats. Let's give them another big round of applause. Thank you so much, Your Excellency.
That's a very insightful sharing by Her Excellency. And the part which I love the most is how the public sector, government officers have to work very closely with the industries to create opportunities for their collaboration to take place across borders, to enable that collaboration to take place. So while the industry, while the engineers in the industry, you are all working together, that public part public-private partnership becomes increasingly important as our world gets more and more globalized, bringing us all together to work together. Now we come to our first panel discussion this morning, opportunities and challenges, energy reset and green economy. Now you all can join the panel on the discussion of a comprehensive transformation towards a sustainable future through strategic allocation of climate finance, fostering of green economic growth facilities and the employment of artificial intelligence. Now before we dive in, do note that for this Q&A segment, we'll only be accepting questions sent through pigeonhole, not on the Zoom chat online for those of you joining us online. So do make sure you scan the QR code on the screen and enter the password WED2024. That's WED2024. So take a quick picture of the QR code. Now later during the Q&A panel as well, we will be sharing the QR code as well. Just remember WED World Engineering Day 2024. Now, to moderate this session, it's my pleasure to invite Professor C. Ram Ramakrishna, Chairman, Circular Economy Task Force NUS, and Chairman, Sustainable Manufacturing Techno Technical Committee, IES. Let's give him a big round of applause, Prof. C. Ram. And now, let's meet our esteemed panelists. Please welcome Ms. Abigail Ng, Executive Director, Markets Policy and Consumer Department, Monetary Authority of Singapore. Mr. Lim Yong Wei, General Manager, Keppel Energy as a Service. And Ms. Therese Norlander, Sustainability D Director, Ground Force Industry. All right, without further ado, I'll pass the time to Professor Sira. Thank you. Well, when I was being mic'd up, I've been asked by a question. Prof, you look stressed. Then I told myself, I'm a senior professor at the National University of Singapore. And I've been moderating Charles Rand distinguished lecture series panels for a few years. So how could I possibly be stressed? But the thing is, in the language of artificial intelligence, I actually did a deep fake. I am stressed. So when you are stressed, we tell ourselves a few things. The first excuse I told myself is, I'm not an English, native English speaker. Well, Excellency has left. I've been preparing to prove her that I know my English very well. I thought I will tell her William Shakespeare. He once said, there is nothing good or bad. It is your thinking that makes so. So obviously, if I think I am not stressed, I think I, I would downplay my stress. <laughs> if I think I am stressed, I would feel I am stressed. And the second one is, I wanted to actually say, I have a fantastic panel, more experienced in sustainability, energy reset, and green economy than the keynote speakers. But I didn't want to say that, because <laughs> that would upset the keynote speakers, right? So, but it's true, today, in first panel, which is entitled, Energy Reset and Green Economy. We have three panelists, smiling, cheerful, on my left side. The first one is uh, Ms. Abigail Ng. She works at the Monetary Authority of Singapore, our Executive Director, Markets, Policy, and Consumer De Department. We all know that uh, 
as a civilization progressed, what we did is we monetized everything. See, in other words, nothing happens without finance. So we have a speaker, eminently qualified about finance, because she's involved with the setting the central financial policy making with a focus on sustainability. Then we have two engineers, our engineering backgrounds are involved in engineering. Madam Rahayu said, nothing is possible, especially for Singapore and the rest of the world, without upsized contributions of engineers, right? Please applause yourself. You're all engineers. We have to tell non-engineers, engineers are also very fun, fun-loving people. So obviously, once in a while, please uh, cheer up a little bit. So we have two highly, deeply involved, accomplished in the engineering industry. One is Mr. Lim Yongwei. He's a general manager, Keppel Energy as a Service. And then we have Ms. Teresa Nolander. She came all the way from the Netherlands. She's a sustainability director for Grinfo's industry. And as was introduced, compared to the previous Charles Red Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, this has two significances. This time we're holding along the time of World Engineering Day celebration. And second one, we made this global. In other words, it's not only Singapore-centric, it's global. So I had informed the panelists ahead of time, uh, this session will be recorded and it will be made available for the people, uh, those who are unable to participate. And we have audience that are sitting in the auditorium. We also have audience on the online. So the, we have about uh, 38 minutes. So we would go in three rounds. In the round one, I would request the panelists one by one to self-introduce themselves and the organization or the topics they're very passionate about. In the round two, round three, round four, depending on how much time we have, I would use the, your questions that you would be putting forward and they would show up on my monitor and I would ask some of those questions to the panelists so that we have a most interactive, communicative panel with you. So with that, i like to now, I have a challenge. Normally when I run a session, I say the ladies first. But now <laughs> we only, I ended up with one man and two ladies, <laughs> right? So, but, but then balance. I think I had to be fair that uh, young way, we know each other because uh, he were, he's an alumni from NUS. He would uh, excuse me that uh, I was the dean when he got the degree. But he actually said, Prof, I don't have that photo with me. I said, it's a good news. I can Photoshop and send you one, <laughs> right? So what I'm going to do is I'll ask uh, the money talks. So we'll get uh, um, Abigail to tell us her inputs, her views, her thoughts about this topic. Abigail. Thanks so much, Prof. I uh, just want to say thank you very much to the IES and uh, for Singapore Poly to uh, having us here today. I think it's a really good opportunity. I don't usually get an opportunity to speak to the people who make the real difference on the ground, engineers, I always say. Uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity. I think Prof. Serum had shared that you know, it's a good chance to kind of like explain a little bit about the other parts of the ecosystem in Singapore's sustainable journey. And I really you know, appreciate that. Um, so I'll just start off by kind of like putting things in context, both for everybody in the auditorium and some of the, I think, international audience. I think we had some slides. Um, That's a clicker. It works, you see? Engineering. Um, <laughs> so this is just, it's a very busy slide. Um, it's not meant to be uh, red per se. I think I wanted to do this one first. Uh, that should be one on, oh, oops. It should be one on the org chart. Was there one on the org chart? Do you guys see it? That's the opening slide. Yeah. Can we get the... 
Yeah, so what they sorted out, I'll just do a slow show. Oh, there we go. Yeah, go. Yeah, okay, sure. just to give a kind of like an overview about where MES sits. So the yeah. MES is, is quite unique actually in the global landscape. We're kind of like what people call a super regulator. Um, we are actually four or five organizations, uh, which would ordinarily be four or five organizations in other countries all rolled into one. Very Singapore style, we're small, uh, we have synergies, we kind of like lump everything together. Um, so these are the four key functions that we have. Um, some of you which might be more familiar with. I come from the first row, which is basically the regulatory side of the house. Uh, I think engineers are also familiar with regulatory authorities. Um, so for us, we supervise the financial services. Um, we do a little bit of financial stability surveillance. In particular, there are two key pillars we supervise. One is what we call prudential supervision. In other words, that's where my colleagues supervise the banks. So MES supervises banks to ensure they are sound, um, they are able to keep running because you do need banks um, to be working properly, not only because they take a lot of retail deposits, yours and mine deposits, and we want to make sure um, they're being run well. They also need to be able to be providers of capital and financing to keep the economy going, uh, both for retail as well as institutional businesses. So that's prudential um, supervision. Um, the other side of the house for supervision is where I come from. Uh, is the capital markets or securities uh, regulation um, side of the house. So in the UK, it would be the Financial Conduct Authority. In the US, the equivalent would be the Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC. So for us, we basically look at the markets, so your stock markets, uh, also your investment products. Uh, we regulate the players. We regulate how business is done with retail. We also regulate how business is done with businesses. So why do we even care about sustainability? Um, I'll explain that in the next slide. I think there's a lag. I will not click so many times this one. Yes, no? Yes. Okay, so this is a big action plan. And as I said, you know, it's a lot of words. It's on the website. It's not meant to be read or gone through today. I just wanted to say that this action plan is actually for the whole of the MAS, for all four or five functions that we have. So I wanted to zoom in on just the green boxes. Uh, these boxes are the ones that relate more to my side of the house, which is about regulation. So I think for regulation, what is a key thing uh, that we have as a link to sustainability? And I think um, many of you would, I suppose, uh, invest in the stock market or buy funds. And before you do that, the first thing you're going to look at are the disclosure documents, right? You want to know what this company is about, what this fund is about. Um, what is this business in? How is this doing? You will look at its financials. So what's very important, apart from financial information and accounting um, records, which we traditionally always look at, moving forward, even more important, as we have heard, of course, given the impacts of climate change, um, is to look at a company's or fund's sustainability report. How are they coping with the impacts of climate change? What is the impact of climate change upon the bottom line now and in the future, whether they have plans uh, to adjust. Um, so in other words, we are here to ensure that the information you get, whether as a business, as a capital provider, as an investor, is going to be useful to you. And nowadays, useful information would have to include disclosure information. So other things that we've done in this space is to put in rules more recently about um, Fund labelling, not every fund can come around and call itself green because there's greenwashing, so we put in rules about that. We've also put in some code of conducts uh, for ESG rating providers. We do need to put some ring fencing and some controls now about who comes out and rates, right? You say if you have a company or if a project and someone comes and say, hey, um, you know, you're not doing very well, you're doing well. We have to make sure that whoever is doing it is of a certain credibility and of a certain standard. So that's kind of areas that we've moved in. Um, we can deep dive into this on, it will take probably another hour or so. So I'll just um, say that that's where we are and that's where we sit and that's where our interest in is. Um, why do we even care? I think at the end of the day, um, making sure that capital allocation, where financiers and where the money is going. We want the money to go into projects, we want the money to go into companies and initiatives that are actually going to make a difference. Um, and I think that's where engineers come in a lot, and I can share a, lot, a bit more about that later. Um, but I think that's kind of like my overview. So back to you, Prof. Thank you, Abigail, for uh, sharing your...
broad and deep dive about uh, financing for sustainability or green finance. Uh, let me invite uh, Therese, please tell us your uh, thoughts. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us. Um, I sit here on behalf of Grundfos, a Danish company, a water solutions company, and we are a proud partner of Polytechnic in Singapore. So, um, so we're delighted to be here and address a little bit of what we are doing when it comes to sustainability um, in connection to water and energy, because that's really where we feel we, we can make a difference together with you. Um, I've been working in sustainability for more than 15 years and uh, joined Grundfos uh, last year. And for me, what is really important is to see how engineers can help make a real impact. Having been in companies that are more on the consumer side of things, I think business to business and, and working with engineers has been an, an eye-opening, uh, positive um, experience so far, because this is what was said earlier today, really a, um, a field where a lot of impact can be made. So I'll focus a little bit on, on that, um, because the world needs making impact, the world doesn't need more words on why sustainability is important. So let's see if I can make this work as a non-engineer. Where were you pointing? <laughs> Just somewhere into, the, into space. Maybe the next slide, if that helps. You see, there you go, with a non-engineer. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's me. So um, what I wanted to bring here is four key trends that I, as a Chief Sustainability Officer for Grundfos Industry, see working at a global level. I think it's important to understand that sustainability as a science is still new, and it's evolving. So that also means that the application for businesses and society will continue to evolve and is certainly not static. Um, and there's a couple of great companies in the world leading the way, but also companies that might have been leading on sustainability, what was understood as sustainability 10 years ago, and now it's a different level of um, implementing and, and really making impact with sustainability. Now we as Grundfos consider ourselves to be amongst the top ones, and that is because we are implementing sustainability into our business. This is not just by making a commitment, but it's understanding how you really then transform your business to, f to then deliver that commitment. So it's one of, the f one of the four key trends I wanted to highlight here today. It's about making impact and taking that impact into your business organization and your product portfolio. The second thing I want to highlight um, beneath that is that we as companies are not playing alone, which is great. As Grundfos, we were the first water solutions company to have a science-based target approved by the science-based target initiative, and we're very proud of that. However, we don't want to play alone there, and the good news is we are not. So we're seeing a, an amount of companies joining um, this movement, if I can say it like that, in a framework which is based on science, uh, and that's what we like, facts and figures. Um, and also the great news being here in, in your fantastic uh, region is that we're seeing a huge growth specifically from APAC. Um, so since last year we saw around 640 new companies entering into this framework and really signing up. And we know that there's more than 1,450 companies in the entire region connected to the science-based targets and, uh, and, and really being ready to make that impact according to an approved plan. So that's all great news. The third trend I want to highlight is that um, we see that climate is still the main topic that everybody wants to invest in, and that's the right thing. So this is also about having focus and understanding where you want to play, how you want to play. However, the other topic that is really rising at a global level, and you have been mastering it here in Singapore as it's been addressed, it's water. So many times, for all the right reasons, we're talking about a climate crisis, but the real crisis is connected to water. And we, as a water solutions company, we really see that it's important to play along this water energy nexus, and I'm happy to speak a little bit more about it later. But what I would love to ask the engineers in the room and listening online, and maybe later listening to the recording, is really make sure that you bring in the water perspective into this climate change perspective. 
We need water solutions because the climate crisis is a water crisis. And then the fourth key thing I wanted to highlight is the relevance of setting frameworks, setting standards, also from a financial point of view, but also from governments. We see that civil society wants governments to take actions, which is great, and I've been reading a lot about the Singapore Green Plan with a lot of interest and in seeing a great holistic plan being framed and being delivered. And I think that is what we need, and that's also what we're seeing, is that despite global companies having a global approach, we see a regional and even local approach, and that is needed if you want to make impact. Now, there's one more thing um, as a double click I wanted to, uh, to highlight here today amongst the four trends. And I, I briefly spoke about this water energy nexus. Um, and green hydrogen has been mentioned here today already because it's a very important and powerful um, new, new angle to renewable energy. But what is super important to the point of the water energy nexus is that we bring in water to this equation. You're engineers, so you probably like facts and figures. I want you to remember the number nine. Nine stands for at least nine liters of water needs to be used to create one kilo of hydrogen. So if we're going to transfer into more renewable energy, and we all know we have to do that, can we please take water in this equation? And if we think about green hydrogen or power to X, can we please address sustainable use of water? So nine liter of water would be already quite clean groundwater if you would desalinate. So if you would take seawater or wastewater, you would need even more water. So the climate crisis and moving into more renewable energy, decarbonizing our society is absolutely needed, but we cannot do it without also bringing in water into the equation, and we cannot do it without the great knowledge of engineers. I'll leave it with it. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> so on that note, I would Good like reason. to invite Yong Wei. Please uh, share your excitement with us. <laughs> um, thank you, IES, SP, for the invite, Prof. Sirum for the introduction. I just want to reiterate, uh, Abigail, so nothing moves without money in the world, as we all know. And I think for Greenforce, obviously, we also adapted some of their solutions in our eventual products that will help to drive the sustainable world. So myself, uh, my name is Yong Wei. So I am uh, graduated from NUS 16 years ago. I was with Kepler for 11 years, driving sustainable solutions uh, in Singapore. So I don't know whether I should bring out the slide first. No. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't have two slides. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe just bring out the first slides. Yeah, then I think just one toggle, I think I'll be there. We need back end magic. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm, so I've been doing sustainability within Kappa for the last six years. So next slide. Yeah, right. okay, that's great. So, uh, so I'm from the infrastructure solution uh, division of Kappa. So we believe we drive the sustainable solution uh, for a greener future. So there are two key areas of our business. One is the integrated power uh, business, is where we do uh, thing, our power projects in Singapore. Currently, we have a 1.3 gigawatt power plant in Singapore. So we serve about maybe one fifth of Singapore energy needs. So we are currently building the most advanced CCGT uh, power plant in Singapore, hydrogen ready for the new economy, where it will be low carbon. So that's the 600 megawatt. At the same time, I think we also do uh, ammonia uh, cracking and also hydrogen imports into Singapore. Those are projects we are undertaking currently. So on the second side, we do our sustainable and uh, re decarbonization solution. So at that portion, I think we serve two out of the four incineration plants in Singapore. We are also active in the water solutioning in which we do distillation plant. So the latest PUB projects, uh, Marina East Desail plant is by Kappa. So and I'm from the energy as a service business. So we, uh, energy as a service, we believe we drive the sustainability uh, solution for the built environment. So we do solar cooling, EV charging, as well as uh, low carbon electricity that we 
sell to the uh, built environment for them to decarbonize. So I think I can go to the next slide. I think just want to iterate what all the speakers have been saying. I think uh, if you just talk and no action, nothing will be done. So at Kappa, we have a re deliver or are implementing several key sustainable projects at the moment. So I think some of which are in the press recently. So we are delivering uh, for Changi Airport Group, the 43 megawatt uh, solar project at the moment. There'll be a larger single site project uh, in Singapore. I think which would not be possible without engineering solutioning. I think I just take it back maybe five to 10 years ago where putting solar panels on the rooftop of maybe airports are the no-no. So I think glare effects uh, in terms of the uh, glare effects and also the impact on the pilots are not surmountable. So with over time, I think with the panels innovation and also how we uh, innovate in terms of our approach, I think we're able to put solar panels on the airport now and it's for the three megawatt project. I think last year we also awarded the Jurong Lake District cooling projects so Kappa is the first and largest cooling player in Singapore. So we have uh, secured from the URA this uh, Drong Lake district projects. It will drive down 30% of the energy needs of this district. And also in terms of, you also serve the private resident who in future will be living there. So we are also active in the built environment in terms of BCA. So we have buildings that we serve. They achieve uh, green mark SLE standards, so like perennial business city. So we serve their cooling, solar, EV charging, as well as electricity needs. Yeah, so this is a very active, the old big box, if you all remember. So also we have, are active in building up the EV ecosystem in Singapore. So we have implemented more than 300 charging stations. So our brand is called Votes. So we really want to push through this uh, new transition to the EV economy in the future. So going forward, I think power imports will be the key to Singapore uh, green transition needs. And uh, we are active in about 1.4 gigawatt of the projects. So one gigawatt from Cambodia, 300 megawatt from Indonesia, and uh, we are already importing 100 megawatt from Laos. So Kappa will be an active player in the sustainability growth of Singapore in the new near future. Thank you, Yong Wei. <laughs> well, Yong Wei, we are very proud that uh, you are innovating and making uh, energy as a service. That's very nice. I uh, will give you a few minutes to take a little bit uh, rest. Uh, let me engage uh, our uh, two uh, key people on the panel. Tara said that um, science-based targets, the importance of transparency, reliability in terms of sustainable disclosures. So Abigail, can you tell us how do you harmonize sustainability reporting? We know that uh, Singapore Stock Exchange said next year all the listed companies have to report as per the standard. Also they said two years later even a non-listed big companies they have to do sustainability reporting. But we are all engineers here. Tell us in terms of sustainability reporting how, as an engineer, we help our own organization to build the capacity and uh, make an impact. Of course, they're all thinking about making money. Mm -hmm. Alongside. 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 <laughs> um, thanks, Prof. I just wanted to riff off a point that Yongwei mentioned as well um, about how we're importing energy in from the region. I just wanted to say that um, in my role, I also plug very much into the Regional Capital Markets Forum. It's an international forum where we spend a lot of time together as regional regulators thinking about disclosures. And I think I just wanted to say that it's not just a Singapore thing. I mean, there are opportunities. We're talking about opportunities for our engineers and our local companies. I think Asia is going to have uh, immense need um, for energy, right? And I think it's going to be actually a key battleground for the world when it comes to battling um, climate change. So energy demand, facts and figures for engineers, and the energy demand in Asia is expected to double actually by 2030. Um, because of economic growth, urbanization, and rising affluence that we see. So I think the figures are 45 million people in Southeast Asia still do not have access to electricity, and that fossil fuels, unfortunately, will still have to play quite an important part um, in this over the next few years. But as we've all talked about, we need to do a, a, a path, right? Um, we need to do a glide path to decarbonization. And I think apart from transition financing, which I kind of alluded to, apart from making sure there's money coming in to fund the efforts of companies 
to fund the efforts of um, in individual initiatives in order to you know develop things like carbon capture technologies, build polders, and all that. So apart from that, I think um, the estimate is that we'll need US 3.1 trillion of infra investment. So this money can't come all from governments. Um, it's a public-private partnership, something that I think um, uh, High Commissioner also mentioned. Uh, so I think there's a part where actually everybody can kind of uh, plug, plug into as well. Um, I think where Energenius can play a part, which is not so commonly spoken about in the financial circles, is actually your knowledge and your, the way that you design your projects or the way that you're planning for your projects are going to be a critical role in supporting how people make decisions or whether or not to put money in a project, whether to fund a project. Right. So for example, if you have a sustainability project um, that could actually impact the financials positively of a company, um, this is information that will be material and under our standards is something that you want to talk about. Um, and on an ongoing basis, people need to know, is this still working, is this not still working? Um, accountants can do it for financials, but who in a company is able to say, yeah, project's on track, yeah, project is decarbonizing um, or not, or we actually have new technology, we can accelerate the rate of decarbonization. So all this actually is going to be able to come from engineers. So the data, the innovation, the rate of progress, tracking it on an ongoing basis to enable a company to accurately reflect this in their financials, to be able to accurately reflect this in their reporting, I think that's a really clear link of how it's going to um, be so relevant to investors and to be relevant as to how much of this money, which makes everything go around, uh, you're going to pull in into the correct projects that we have. And don't forget, I think ASEAN does need a lot of that transition finance. Everybody's going to try and get attention. Um, so then what's the difference? The difference is the quality of your data, the credibility of the data, and how well you're able to monitor that, how well you're going to be able to communicate that. So what gets measured gets done. So I think, um, in my mind, um, engineers really play a big role in that. Thank you, Abigail. Abigail confirms we all have jobs because we are good in uh, measuring, reporting, also can verifying the data. Thank you. Especially Abigail is a legal background. She's a financial uh, expert now. So if a legal, legal person and a financial expert endorses engineers, obviously we're on the right track. Right? I, always say, I always say to my team, we spend a lot of time working on standards internationally, right? Yeah. And we spend you know, hours and hours on midnight calls working out standards. But at the end of the day, I always tell my people, you know, we can have the most beautiful standards. Um, we have the most beautiful financing plans. But who's going to save the world? Yep. Engineers and scientists are the ones that we are supporting, right? We need to get carbon capture done. We need to get water you know, and circular economy done. So you guys, uh, we're counting on you to save the world. Thank you, Abigail. So I have a question to the audience. How many of you play Toto? Uh. No? OK. <laughs> the reason is I'm going to pick the brain of uh, Therese, because she's an expert. I'm going to ask her. Tell us, given the global divides, you know, that's happening, right? Whether uh, we agree or not, whether we uh, believe it or not, but there is a massive global divides are happening. How do we drive sustainability across this uh, global divides? More importantly, because uh, I think there is, this is the first time you came to Singapore? No, it's my second time. Second time. I'm lucky. So there yeah. is a secret here. We play Toto, and there we pick the Lottery. numbers to become rich. And okay. there we need to look for the hints. So tell us the hints. Which are the five high growth areas for sustainability, given this uh, you know, global divide and so on? Right. Well, thank you. Um, Sorry, I'm not promoting Toto. Don't play it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you got me curious, though. Um, so. Um, thank you for the question. I think, as you say, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of complexity in the world today. Um, but what I think can be a way through is, one, through science, um, and therefore through academia and, and institutions that really drive and rely on science and continue to develop the science, because facts don't lie. 
And second, I feel when you look at sustainability and how we can ensure that development and transformation keeps on happening, businesses are the right ones to put your money in. Um, and, uh, and that is because these businesses, they need to drive global supply chains, global value chains, uh, and global development. And so that might be a way to help connect uh, the different divides and complexities that we are seeing. Now into your question in terms of what would be the five winners, as you say. Um, now I don't have a crystal ball, but what I can tell based on our experience and how we are working with growing industries and, and helping our customers to grow, I would say the renewable energy section uh, sector is really a winner. And specifically, of course, uh, solar, we've spoken about it, wind, but also power tonics or hydrogen. But still remember the number nine, please. So power to X, yes, hydrogen, but with sustainable water management. So renewable energy sector, definitely. Food and beverage is also a growing sector. I mean, the population in the world is growing. More people need food. Um, but not only, let's say, the traditional food and beverage sector, also looking at what we're seeing here grow, with my help of, of great colleagues here in the region, we see that there are new innovations happening in food and beverage industry, specifically high protein, plant-based. So I would also really encourage in looking into that uh, from an engineering perspective, because these are new um, industries within an established sector, and they're quite water intense. So, um, so that definitely is, is another fast growing sector. Semiconductors is a growing sector, and specifically in this part of the, the world, we know there's a lot happening. High demand for energy, high demand for water. So again, this water energy nexus that I spoke about is an important one, and therefore a lot of smart engineers are needed there to help make sure that the growth of these sectors and industries is being done in the most sustainable way, both uh, from an economic uh, perspective, but also from a real, true sustainability technological perspective. So those would be the three. And then, of course, mobility always. And then I would say a little bit more into a holistic approach, sustainable living. And again, I've, I've studied the Singapore Green Plan, and I've been super impressed by the holistic approach and also understanding how sustainable living from a housing, public transport, and wider ecosystem uh, perspective is, uh, is important. So I would say those would be my five big bets. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> You know, Therese uh, you know, convinces me that she did the homework very well. <laughs> because panel two is about sustainable living and a resilient future. I think next time, in case I'm not available, she will be your model. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be happy uh, to come back. <laughs> OK, you're welcome. So Yong Wei, you have enough breather. Yeah, yes. uh, you are ready to take the really? uh, you know, tough questions. Sure. And now I'm going to stay, because we only le left with uh, less than eight minutes, so lots of questions came to the, this monitor, and I've been flipping through those questions. Uh, let me field those questions so that you will be satisfied uh, that we did ask the questions to the panel. So there are lots of questions Yong Wei. So I'm just folding everything into those things. And this. The question is, what exactly is reset from the, what Teresa said, you are a smart engineer. That's what she just now said. Okay. Right? So, second yeah. part is, today's headline is the nuclear energy for Singapore. Yeah. So tell us, maybe uh, stretch your brain and then uh, tell us maybe in next 20, 30 years. Uh, we are competing, right? So maybe 20, 30, 20, 45. What's the likely energy mi mix, future energy mix of Singapore? And once you convince, Abigail will sign the checks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think since we're all engineers here, I thought in terms of engineering terms, I think nuclear has been spoken about for a long time. I think Singapore, for its lack of space and uh, also in terms of national security, could be a bit risky. So I think nuclear could be a bit less on the priority list. I think based on uh, Singapore plan, I think it's 40% uh, on uh, low carbon energy like hydrogen, ammonia, 40% on imports, 20% on solar, and geothermal and other energy needs. I think it's really on tracks in terms of the capability of engineering skill sets. 
I think we are, I think energy imports is, uh, I think is technically possible. I think it's also opened up a new realm of engineering capability. I think, I think the thing that Kepler has been grabbing with is always like subsea cables engineers. So who in Singapore has done subsea cables? And on the scale of uh, 1,000 kilometers where you link neighbors together. So that's a huge undertaking. I think it's something that we have not done before. Not that it cannot be done, but it is a huge engineering uh, capability. And also, <coughs> in terms of financing, you require a lot of financing uh, to make that happen. But it's engineering possible. So to do a 40% of energy, Singapore energy needs on that, I think it's doable and it's possible. So I think that will form the first, I think, energy resets, 40% on uh, energy imports and for our neighbors. And the next 40% is on low, energy, low carbon energy. So Kepler currently is building a 600 megawatt uh, power plant that's hydrogen ready. And, and there are two other players that also has also subsequently started constructing or gotten approval to do so. So that forms the energy resets component of the low carbon energy. And that is the hydrogen <coughs> thing that we spoke about, that like Teresa has spoken about, or even ammonia. But having said that, there's a huge challenges. So not only through the, I think the energy water nexus that require a lot of water, and also to bring hydrogen over such a long distance is, uh, I think it's not engineering possible, not technically possible at this moment, but it's not impossible. I think engineers have uh, proven that we can bring LNG from long distances at minus 165. So hydrogen is another leak, you need to do it at like two to 300 degrees, minus two to 300 degrees Celsius. So there's no engineering that needs to go into it or a lot of R&D and to lessen the burn rate as uh, the boil off rate as it goes over the ocean. So hydrogen to the power plant and the power plants are ready. I think it's the next 40%, which I think is still engineering possible. Obviously the next 20%, I think things like solar, I think in Singapore is very, very viable and commercially viable as well. So you've seen everywhere there are solar panels. I think every month, every week you open a newspaper, you see one news report about new projects getting bigger and bigger. And it's because of the commercial viability and also technically possibility. But behind that, there's needs to have a lot of engineers. So both in terms of what uh, Abigail has said, to build it, to project manage it, to measure it, and to construct it and to optimize it as well. So engineers need to go in. And, but it's constrained by Singapore natural constraint in terms of the space. So I've seen the video like floating solar. So Kepler is looking at some of this innovation that we need to expand into the sea space, more innovation to take place, more engineers to come into the area so that to develop more innovative products. And then Joe Thermal, obviously, I think is study about Sambawan hot spring, I think whether we can get more heat out of it. I think it's something worth technically to evaluate and study. And I think it will form our next 20%. Thank you, Yong Wei. Well, we are left with three minutes. Then I have to make sure I feel more questions from what you've been proposing. Uh, I want to make sure this question is more relevant to as many of you as possible. Uh, I consider this way that it is something called small size trap. That is, when, when when your economy or when your country or when your organization is small, sometimes we feel uh, risk averse. The small and medium enterprises where bulk of the employment takes place, and many of our companies are actually suppliers for the multinational companies. So obviously many of you are leading those companies or working for those companies. So there's actually a question, what will be the key impetus for SMEs to commit to the sustainability goals. So maybe uh, now you pick yourself the sequence so that uh, I don't look bad. So uh, go ahead and give your answer. Okay, I'll do my but keep it short first. because yeah. it's about less than two yeah, minutes. I wanted to say that I think uh, for SMEs, we've paid a lot of attention to that. Um, not only for Singapore, but in the region. I think in Asia, right, I think 90, 90, 90 upwards to 98% of companies are actually uh, SMEs, and this is area of, of concern. So when it comes to regulation and requirements, as, as Prof has pointed out, um, are the requirements too much? I just wanted to say, I think in working on the international front, we have been very, very vocal about giving feedback about what ASEAN needs, and particularly what SMEs need. So at the end of the day, the standards that were rolled out uh, sometime last year actually include what we call proportionality mechanisms. Uh, in a nutshell, this means that it depends on the size of your company. There are certain reliefs or exclusions that will apply to a smaller company. So for example, in the first year, uh, you might be 
uh, not required to do scope free reporting. There are even um, ongoing exclusions that say that, okay, if say you are unable to get certain data without undue cost or it's too burdensome, then instead of getting the data, you can talk about qualitatively. So I think i um, very cognizant of the needs of SMEs, both in Singapore and the region, and we've worked to ensure that these mechanisms and proportionality um, uh, regulatory release are worked in place so that it's something that's manageable. Having said that, this is a train everybody has to get on at some point in time. Um, because you know, if you don't do it, you're going to have problems with your financing and you can't grow and we all can't get the world to where we need to be. So I think the key is to just take the baby step. Um, you don't have to be perfect in your first report, but to just get started. There are lots of grants, there are a lot of capacity building um, initiatives out there. So just get started and we'll all learn along the way. Thank you, Abigail. So I just to add on, so I think for SME, I think in terms of regulation, I think Abigail has uh, spoken about, Two is the expectation of your downstream customers of you to become green. So three, I think on the hiring of the young people these days, I think sustainability plays a key role of how sustainable your company is. It helps to attract talents <coughs> into your company. And fourth, I think in terms of commercial viability, things like solar and uh, I think it's really very commercially viable. So putting solar on the roof doesn't not only help you to become more sustainable, but also help to save money. So it's doing good and doing well. well why not? Yep. Very difficult to add when you've had so, so many good points already. I think the one thing I would like to add is um, SMEs should also really work together and also work with maybe the bigger companies because all big companies have supply engagement programs to make sure that they deliver on their commitments. So an SME is not on, on his or her own. I think that's an important uh, point to make. Um, whether it's collaborating across because then you can really build a, a sustainable supply chain or working with the bigger company that you're working with or supplying could be a really, really good way also to help educate yourself and, and get moving in, in steps. So instead of eating the elephant at once, try smaller steps, eating, eating smaller pieces and you'll get there because sustainability for me in the end is about getting going and nothing is perfect. So everybody's continuing to learn and, uh, and being on that journey. So for every SME, I would invite them to start that journey and collaborate. And then uh, by eating it in pieces, they'll get there. Thank you, Therese. Well, I think you all agree that uh, you made my life easy. So as a panelist, because you send lots of questions, panelists for extemporeas. I don't know how to search for the questions. And we took all the time that is allocated to us. So please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And the key message here is, if you don't want to miss out the future, make sure you pursue sustainability. That's basically the message our panelists, with their experience and commitment, are telling us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's also give a big thank you to Professor Siram for moderating this excellent session. Thank you so much. Give me a please round of applause. And I'd like to invite all our panelists back to their seats. It's my pleasure now to invite our next distinguished keynote speaker, Mr. Pang Singtian. Zone President, East Asia, Schneider Electric, on stage to give us his address. Mr. Pang, please. Good morning, everyone. So, Mr. Song Wan Ho, Principal and the CEO, Singapore Polytechnic, Mr. Del Wen Chong, the President of IES. So, uh, it's my uh, honor to be here. And thank you for having me today. I'm Pang Xinjie, Zone President, and uh, also uh, for Shanghai Electric Asia for quite a long time. It's an honor to be here among such esteemed guests. Well, I have a very long career in Schneider Electric. I'm a mechanical engineer and then automation engineer for my training. So today's topic 
is you about the, we need an engineers to have mindset to tackle the most pressing challenging of our time and set us on a path to a sustainable future. So you all know we are at an inflection point. We face interwine crisis. On the one hand, access to energy and exponentially increasing energy demand. On the other hand, the climate crisis that threaten our planet. To tackle the climate crisis, we need to decarbonize. The amount of carbon in our atmosphere has risen exponentially over the last hundreds or so. Today, levels are higher than they have been on Earth for more than two million years. So progress is already being made, but not enough. To be on track for a net zero world in 2050, we need to have half emissions this decade. Current commitment would account for about four gigatons of annual CO2 savings by the end of this decade, that puts us only on at a 2.5 centigrade pathway. To be on track for 1.5 centigrade, we need to go three times faster, and energy must be at the heart of our efforts. The first good news is that technology already exists to put us back on the right pace. In fact, our own research shows that it is entirely possible to decarbonize energy completely by 2050, as well as making it more widely accessible. How do we do this? Every time there has been an industry revolution, it has been driven by demand for more energy. The most recent force industry revolution has been driven by digitalization. And by combining this with more clean electricity, energy evolves from being the biggest driver of carbon emissions to the biggest opportunities of carbon reduction. Electricity is the fastest, most effective vector for decarbonization. We call this electricity 4.0, and we believe this is our fast path to net zero. Net zero. Electric 4.0 is our vision to achieve energy and sustainability goals from strategy to execution. Digital drives efficiency. It allows us to make energy more visible to understand better how we are using it and automate process to deliver smart, optimized consumption, not to go with less, but just to cut out the waste. And the electric makes energy green. It is the most efficient energy, and it's the best vector for decarbonization because it's an energy source that can be increasingly decarbonized over time, as we can't decarbonize fossil fossils. So when you put these two together, electric city 4.0 becomes the fuel for a new electric world. For a more sustainable and a more resilient world with the energy that's green and smart. So now that we have a formula for sustainability, the next good news is that more governments are making commitments. Notably, 74 countries pledged net zero by the close of the COVID, COP26, which brings the global total according to Climate Watch to around 90 countries with net zero pledges worldwide, representing 90% of global CO2 emissions 
and spending of 1.3 trillion US dollars in government clean energy investment since 2020. And here, Singapore leads. Its Green Plan 2030 is explanatory and sets Singapore on a path to achieve net zero emission by 2050. Green Plan demonstrates Singapore's commitment to climate actions and sustainable development in synchronized with international efforts and the global sustainability agenda. And there's more good news. We know that the path to net zero is forged through partnership. And increasingly, we are seeing the private sector making ambitious sustainability commitments. Our own research shows that 94% of companies in Asia, including nine countries of East Asia, have established sustainability goals for our targets. But only 44% of companies have a comprehensive strategy in place to achieve those goals. So we can see that there's clear intent from the private sector, but there are barriers to actions. We call this the green action gap. And in this part, the world, about half of all companies fall into it. And globally, the picture gets a bit more there. In 2022, only 12% of Fortune 500 companies were delivering on their sustainability commitment or had achieved significant climate milestones. In Asia, we can see financial barriers, lack of access to capital, or high cost of decarbonization are mostly commonly cited as standing in the way of decarbonization, but also a lack of clean energy alternatives, softer resources, and operational obstacles. So we are hearing from companies that there's lots of standings in the way when they are trying to solve from strategy to actions. But we can, so, we can also see that Companies are starting to find a pace and deploy the tools and the technology lead, leaders are, uh, available to them. Nearly all East Asia business leaders agree that digitalization and energy efficiency are key to their corporate sustainability strategy. And in Singapore, a remarkable 99% of business leaders believe decarbonization goals and the targets should be linked to C-suite remuneration, showing an increasing appetite for accountability. So again, we can see Singapore leading here. We also see the Singapore 96% of business leaders agree that technology will be key in driving their sustainability and decarbonization strategy, but only about half view that they are fully utilizing technology to pursue their sustainability targets. And even in Singapore, a sustainability leader, we see the same barriers, access to data and the lack of investment that creates difficulties integrating solutions into operations. So how we can move from strategy to actions? We need an engineer's mindset. And we see this coming from best-in-class companies following a three-step framework to strategize, digitize, and decarbonize. A clear path to a more sustainable future. Strategize is about building a robust plan where we are today where do we want to be tomorrow? How will we get there? And what to, who do we need on the journey with us? It requires a holistic view across the entire value chain, including scope one, two, and three.
Digitize is about understanding and monitoring energy and the carbon in real time. When we monitor it, we can understand where we can save it. Only then we can start accurately reporting and benchmarking progress. And the decarbonize is about the combination of replacing energy supply, electrifying process, and the redu reducing energy and the resource use for more efficiency and uh, circularity. So there you have it. The climate challenge is really an energy challenge. We have the tools we need. The question is, do we have the collective will? How can we unlock our engineers' mindset to approach this challenge systematically, we need to strategize, digitize, and decarbonize. And the moment is now. Together, we can engineer a path to net zero and create a more sustainable future for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fan. I'd like to request you remain on stage. I'd also like to invite Mr. Dawson Chung, President of IES, and Mr. So Wai Wa, Principal and CEO of SV, on stage to present the tokens. Mr. Dawson, Mr. So, please. Let's give another big round of applause for Mr. Pang from Schneider Electric. Big smiles for the camera. Let's give them all a big round of applause. Thank you all. I'd like to invite you back to your seats. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our second panel discussion for this morning, the approach to foster a resilient future and sustainable living. You will get to hear from our panelists as they share their insights, experiences, and innovative approaches as they delve into strategies and initiatives aimed at building a resilient future and promoting sustainable living practices. Once again, do know for the Q&A segment, we'll only be accepting questions through pigeonhole. So uh, avoid typing your questions on the Zoom chat or live for those of you joining us online. Now you can scan the QR code shown on the screen Enter the password WED 2024 to access the Q&A platform. Now, once again, to moderate the session, it's my pleasure to invite again, Professor Siram Ramakrishna. Let's give a big round of applause. And now let's meet our panelists. Please welcome Dr. Engineer Dennis Hidayat, President of the Institution of Engineers Indonesia and Chairperson of the National Capital Infrastructure Development Task Force. Next, Mr. David Chaya, Partner, Infrastructural Advisory, KPMG Singapore. And Ms. Georgina Poor, Deputy Principal, Development, Singapore Polytechnic. All right, Professor Siram, over to you. Thank you. So how are you feeling? <laughs> Well, it, as long as we live, it's about living, right? And living is not possible unless the ecosystem that we live is well designed, well operated, and we feel comfortable. And that's basically the essence of it. So we have carefully chosen this panel so we want to tilt the balance, two men and uh, one woman, but that's intentional. So I know Catherine is uh, 
very familiar with the process, the vision of Singapore Poly commitment to the sustainability we heard from the principal uh, this morning. Uh, she would take us through a little more details in this particular uh, self-introduction as well as Q&A. And we have uh, Devan um, Chaya and from the KPMG. Uh, they guide the co companies, organizations, and countries in terms of building uh, resilient future and sustainable living. But the proof of the pudding is actually doing it. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, speaker, colleague, panelist uh, from Indonesia. Uh, I do not know whether he actually sleeps or not because he has to raise uh, 50 billion dollars in the next uh, 20 plus years. Uh, there's a vision to have this uh, new city which is sustainable, smart, and green and a global city, and he would talk about it. But he has to get this done by 2045, and he needs about uh, $50 billion. So it's, I think it's a wonderful. So we have a fantastic panel here. Just like the last first panel, uh, round one, I invite the panelists to have a self-introduction. Uh, they would give their uh, key messages. Then after that, uh, Pigeon Hole, your, your questions will uh, flow in. I will try to balance and include as many of your questions as possible. So make sure you uh, keep putting your questions into the uh, Pigeon Hole. With that background, uh, basic introduction, I'd like to now invite our... Uh, Catherine, you agree, right? We need to treat neighbors well, and we respect the neighbors very well. So I think I like to call upon, uh, I would pronounce the name very well. I practice a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Our good friend from Indonesia, Dr. Engineer Danis Hidayat Sumadeliga. Please welcome him to okay. introduce about ICANN. Thank you. I, allow me? Sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you to IAS for inviting me uh, to give a speech for this occasion. And also special to my friend Andy Cheng. Please stand up, Andy Cheng. He is the uh, PII chapter from Singapore. He's my fr close friend from Singapore. So I'd like to explain about the smart city concept in our new capital city. First of all, I'd like to explain about the background. Yeah. See, so it was in August 2019, um, our president taken very important decision to relocate, relocate the capital city of Indonesia to East Kalimantan. That is the map showing the position. And this is the most important thing I'd like to convey in this uh, forum. The main purpose of this relocation is not, is not only to relocate, relocate the center government, but also to build a new super economic hub outside Java that will give an impact to the flap center and eastern side of Indonesia. As maybe you already aware, in this current time, our national GDP uh, <coughs> uh, island of Java contribute more than 90% of our national GDP. And in Java itself, more than 57% of uh, population of Indonesia. So we are more in the western part of development. That's why we try to relocate to, as I said before, to make a, a new development in the center and eastern side of Indonesia. Jakarta itself, as a current capital city and Java Island, already facing several problems, which are clean water, high land of uh, conversion, in, uh, high rate of land conversion, concentrated urbanization in metropolitan, and also de decrease in carrying capacity, and also high level economic loss in Jakarta. Nusantara, 
as the new capital city has a vision to be a city for all three main goals. We are, which are global sustainable city, future economic driver, and national identity symbol. To build a Nusantara, as uh, shown in the timeline, we have uh, five stages. Now we are in the first stage of development. Uh, the first timeline, we call it as initial stage or initial phase, the development of urban infrastructure, basic, will consist of targeted land development, priority office building such as presidential palace and government complex, housing for government employee and other basic infrastructure such as road, drainage system, water supply and sanitation. And then the most important thing also, the regulation. To make sure the sustainability of Nusantara project, the government of Indonesia already put the concept in government laws and regulation, especially uh, law number three of 2022 on capital city and each revision and also supported by derivative rules consists of government regulation, presidential regulation, etc. So this is our new development really back up, fully back up by the regulation. And then now go to the Nusantara Smart City concept. In terms to realize the vision of uh, a world city for all, the Smart City concept will be implemented in Nusantara. The implementation of Smart City will use five approach, which are green, resilient, sustainable, inclusive, and smart. The Smart City in Nusantara also will be implemented in six categories. Smart governance, smart transportation and mobility, smart living, smart natural resources and energy, smart industry and human resources, smart build, environment and infrastructure. Those six smart category in Nusantara will have its application and will be integrated. To support those, there will be active and passive infrastructure that will be built. Active infrastructure such as command center, data center, supported not only fixed broadband infrastructure such as fiber optic cable network, but also with mobile broadband infrastructure such as BTEs, 5G, and SA. The passive infrastructure now is being built, the physical infrastructure like multi-utility tunnel and pole. And based on the current, uh, on bleep, based on our blueprint, we can uh, imagine that uh, there will be autonomous as in 2020, in 2045, autonomous uh, as an on-demand public transport, advanced air mobility, autonomous mobile drones, comprehensive electric vehicle ecosystem, and also uh, artificial intelligence power, fully digital one-step service for resident, internet of things, smart building ecosystem, and advanced commuter information system. In 2045, the Ibu Kota or the capital city also will be supported by renewable energy that will be optimized by smart grids and meters, smart farming ecosystem with implemented precision farming, urban agriculture, internet of things based to monitor and control water quality, natural disaster early warning system, biodiversity and carbon stock monitoring system. And this is, uh, I like to inform you, as I said before, that we are in the first stage. This is showing you the progress of uh, the existing now. So this is the dam, the water, uh, water treatment plan, next, and other toll road, etc. So I like to conclude that the concept of Nusantara already translated into govern government laws regulation and design as well as already implemented by construction process in this current time. In the August 2024, there will be an independent ceremony in Nusantara and since then Nusantara will be official as our capital city of Indonesia and also the future will be one of the smart cities in the world. Thank you. Ah, oh, sorry. Last, go back, last slide. Oh, this is showing the, the, the investment process is already starting in our capital city. This is some hotel, hospital, 
and also apartment etc from the private uh, company thank you well then as you, i must agree in the venture capital world we give give about 60 seconds they make the pitch he has done a wonderful pitch about nusantara and we wish you uh, really all the best and now the next uh, i will invite uh, next panelist dr devan chaya from kpmg uh, he's special because uh, big four most of the people don't have a doctor in the, their uh, title so he has a doctor so he's going to tell us uh, his insights please sure thanks thanks so much um ies and sp for having me here it's a great pleasure to be amongst the fraternity so before the doctor there was an engineer too so i have uh, done my engineering but i got the voltage is wrong <laughs> so <laughs> i did my electronics but all my life i have spent on the electrical side which is on the high voltage so essentially it was an engineering with the wrong voltage but uh, i somehow managed it um one more um antithesis that also happens is as as prof just mentioned uh, kpmg and engineers day also don't go together because we are mostly known as the audit firm but happy to say that there is a big transition happening and we do realize that without the technical standpoint we will have very difficult discussions when we bring up standards we uh, in the previous session we also had uh, discussions around standards of reporting etc and that will become more and more difficult if we don't have the technical tonality uh, added to our reporting requirements and therefore we have um, made sure that we can get as much technical strength into our uh, esg consulting space as possible and happy to say that we are about uh, 60% plus engineers now in my team which is mainly around decarbonization so it is really growing in that space where engineering the core technical uh, capabilities are coming together with the financing requirements so to take that point further one of the areas that uh, we are now focusing on is infratech and that's the practice that i lead in kpmg is around technology which is applicable to infrastructure and infrastructure has been a core component of uh, using operational technologies but there is a high element of digital coming into play so it is important that we marry the cons concept and uh, go for the convergence and you rightly mentioned about the iot uh, convergence of ot systems and it systems needs to happen to make a sensible transition Uh, into the new age of energy so that's really the reason why infratech is going to be our mainstay uh, especially in the infrastructure advisory space the second one which i want to talk about is the initiative that we have embarked on as kpmg is firmly rooted in the belief that it is not possible for a organization an, an organization or a firm a single firm to provide all the solutions which are required to decarbonize ourselves as a humanity and that is where we will need to come together for fostering this we have uh, launched the asean decarbonization hub where uh, we are calling on ecosystem partners to come in together we have signed several mous including uh, singapore polytechnic and a few other uh, ihls to um, come together and create this ecosystem where we address the three pillars now what are the three pillars that we would like to address are one is the strategy and road map which you heard in the keynote address strategize which is very important so strategy and road mapping is going to be the first pillar the second pillar is around the technology aspect so which technologies will be the mainstay you heard from tarees earlier around the various technology options that are arising and we are maturing in various other technologies which were nascent to a, uh, a point in time so technology is the other pillar and the third pillar which is extremely important is where is the money and therefore the third pillar that we address is sustainable finance how do organizations access sustainable finance 
such that we are able to create viable projects, whether it's the PPP model, which is public-private partnerships, or it is through a blended finance mechanism that Abigail also spoke about. So where is the money going to come from? So these are the three major pillars that we have. And third one, if I can just take 30 seconds more, is around the livability of cities. Because what we um, firmly believe is that cities, especially cities like, the, like Singapore or Nusantara, which are a great microcosm, a great sandbox for us to test out new technologies, new ways of working, new ways of living, are going to be extremely important for us in the future to actually create that roadmap of how cities need to transition themselves out of the fossils into the new energy. So those are the, in, uh, the initial thoughts that I had uh, in terms of sharing. Thank you, Devan. Now let's uh, turn our attention to smiling Georgine, Georgina. Georgina, I do not know why the event uh, managers felt I'm scared of you. <laughs> so they put you the other side, they put me on this side. But I'm sure you would uh, you'd okay with that one. But uh, fun aside, uh, I want to appreciate that uh, you've been very proactive. In fact, I received her uh, messages past midnight about today's uh, panel. So that means she works very hard. Mr. So, <laughs> your colleague works extremely hard. Maybe you are driving her too hard. <laughs> but that's what happens. I was used to be the vice president at the National University of Singapore. I know the culture, at least a little bit. So I think it's good that we work hard, but at the same time we smile. And uh, Georgina has been smiling very good and very proactive. May I invite Ms. Georgina Poa, who is from this host institution, which is Singapore Poly. Yeah. Please tell us more. Thank you, Siram. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Singapore Polytechnic. Now, um, I hope you're no stranger of Singapore Poly, Poly uh, but I'm also reminded that there are online uh, audience from the other part of the world. So allow me to give a brief introduction to Singapore Polytechnic. Established in 1954, Singapore Polytechnic is the first polytechnic in Singapore. And this year, we are marking our 70th anniversary. So if you look at our logo, 70 year, 70, it marks our 70th anniversary. Right? Today, Singapore has five polytechnics. And from a poly that uh, prepare only for uh, working uh, for vocation for to prepare the uh, technical training uh, for full-time students, today we have evolved. Today, Singapore Singapore Polytechnic is a polytechnic of all ages, with threefold missions. First, we continue to provide industry relevant training to our pre-employment fresh graduate. So. Sustainability is surely part of the program. Now, beyond, we also uh, provide continuing education training for adult learners, for the workforce, so that they can upskill, reskill to ensure they are relevant they, uh, for the industry. Thirdly, not known to many, it is also Summer Polytechnic's mission to support the industry in. Uh, industry transformation, especially for the small and medium-sized enterprises. Right? We help them upskill and so that they can stay relevant, so that they can uh, have new creation uh, to stay in this ever-changing uh, economic lands landscape. Now, to ensure that we fulfill our mission, Samoa Poly has a uh, cluster comprising three departments, Department, Department of Industry and Partnership, uh, Technology, Innovation and Enterprise, as well as our CET armed, which is known as PACE Academy, Professional and Adult Continuing Education. Together with these three units, we form a uh, Singapore SP Company and Workforce Transformation Program to support our industry, our SMEs, in upscaling, in offering solutions uh, to meet their needs. And like what Devan just said, no one single party 
can do decarbonisation alone. So in our whole journey, we have different industry partners to help us bridge the gap and meet the needs of industry. So of these, within the, the uh, development cluster, there are 12 technology consultancy as well as training centres within Singapore Polytechnic. One of these centres set up in about one and a half year ago is titled the Centre for Environmental Sustainability and Energy Efficiency. And this is a centre that will front the sustainability initiative. Uh, let me stop at this point now. Thank you. Well, I need to congratulate uh, Georgina because she succeeded in pushing other polys to run for their money, right? Because SP is seizing the, seizing the future which is going to be driven by sustainability according to the, uh, all the speakers so far as well as the panelists. So Georgina, you've done well. So we give you a little time so that uh, we have more heated questions for you. On this note, let's, let's turn our attention to our good friend, a good neighbor. Dennis. Yes. Your election just over, <laughs> right? Uh, he's smiling, that means he's happy with the outcome. <laughs> so given you have a new leadership, using their lens, how would you see the opportunities, challenges for Nusantara? <laughs> yes, thank you for the question. Uh, as, you, as I explained before, Nusantara is fully backed up by law and regulation. The law itself was approved in the parliament more than 93%. So really fully supported by, and then uh, so far, uh, the result of the election itself is not announced uh, formally. Yeah. Uh, we have to wait until 20 of March, but so far the <laughs> indication, the data show that the possibility of that really support the continuation of IKN development, our new president and our vice president. The potential, our new president and our uh, vice president will support because they said during the campaign. So law, uh, law and regulation and also promise during the campaign, inshallah, will continue. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are understood from Then is that the confidence level is very high on IKN. IKN. Now I ask Devan, tell us how do you build in resiliency in a, such a planning process and how do you make this truly a sustainable living? That is an example, but you could always uh, go beyond IKN, probably Singapore or other countries. Sure. Um, the, I, I can narrate a few um, examples of cities which have done pretty well. Some of them are in Europe, the obvious ones around Barcelona, Eidenhoven, um, Copenhagen. Uh, all these have done pretty well in terms of meeting most of the smart city initiatives. Initially what we used to call as smart cities, of course now the focus has completely shifted to becoming sustainable cities. But even in the smart city age, we used to have a concept of resilience because that's resilience in, in very simple terms. And this is what uh, the mayors are used to hearing is that how quickly can a city bounce back when it has faced a challenge. So it's more about preparing for the eventualities and making sure that we have enough in our ammunition to actually go out and fix those problems quickly and not impact the lives of citizens as much as possible. So that's really the, the core essence. But where cities have actually succeeded, 
and this is uh, a non copyrighted term so this is mine but you are free to use it's the sustainative design mm -hmm. essentially we need to make sustainability as the native concept for all things that we design unless we start thinking about e s and g components of into our designs right from the start and start questioning who is going to be impacted by using this design who are the people who might be displaced because of this design who might be disadvantaged because of a design so it's not only about how cool the design is or how does it actually solve a problem does it really create more problems for the future is what we need to start thinking about and the successful cities have actually like, uh, taken this approach and made it into a culture so i can narrate a few cities which i have examples for and most of it is around creating green spaces creating tr effective transportation creating enough alternative energy sources uh, taking into account the citizen services all of that has an underlying element now which is the culture do we have a sustainability led culture and if we can bring that in then we start automatically looking at various aspects which are truly important for us to make those designs sustainable and live beyond our lifetime one of the other things which uh, also comes in the play is the which uh, dr danes just mentioned about the elections and it is important to also know that the terms of mayors and governors are limited and they need to seek re-election so when we start the dis the discussions it cannot be limited to the five year term of individual mayors it has to be long much term. more long term and i think one of the things that nusantara has done pretty well is about making it a legal construct so you cannot have a Un an uncertainty creeping in because of political changes so those are the aspects which we need to ad really address at the core of it to make the sustainable designs possible for the yes. long term thank you devan now i understand how you got your doctor <laughs> <laughs> so uh, key message he said is uh, to build resilience we need to ingrain sustainability and those who follow nature and nurture debate we all agree that uh, nurture is uh, our window to ingrain something into the people and obviously education institutions from starting from pre primary to the universities mm -hmm. they do that so georgina tell us how are you ingraining sustainability more important is uh, as abigail uh, i worked uh, i also work in the committee in the singapore institute of directors i wrote an article on uh, green washing but we keep flagging the companies about the green washing question is how higher education institutions avoid the trap of uh, green washing help us to navigate this uh, waters mm. i can't help but wonder did you ask these questions because you you <laughs> you are doubtful of our 60 30 vision <laughs> <laughs> okay so i i feel compelled to to expand uh, to explain about how we will go about with this 60 30 vision and then we talk about later part right now uh as uh, mr so shared uh last year we have um, engaged kpmg uh, as a consultant to help us look at our whole environment yeah uh, to look at our baseline and how could we possibly uh work out a road map strategy to take so that we can become net zero before 2045 okay and through the findings i think kpmg has came back and we have validated it right um in fact by changing and upgrading our chillers by transitioning to led lighting and also um installing solar panels this will uh, together uh, another very important element to say our singapore government is also working very hard yeah to make the energy greener so i think by 2030 our national grid will be something like 12% greener so we've changing our chiller um by replacing transiting to led so and so forth we'll be able to kind of like uh reduce 
the carbon emission by about 40%. Yeah. Right? Uh, and together with the solar panel installation, uh, estimated to be 11 to 12% saving, and the greener national grid, yet another uh, 12%. Yeah. So this already uh, exceeded 60%. That's why we are very comfortable. Now, what we are also doing, instead of just giving you things that you can't see right at the back. Now, as uh, David mentioned, to be resilient, you really need to be part of a lifestyle as well, right? Yeah. So we need to be able to also live a life that is of lower carbon. Now, so changing mindset, embracing these whole challenges uh, is, is one of the key things. So in Simba Polytechnic, uh, last year we've introduced a 5% challenge to all our schools and departments. The purpose of this 5% challenge is so that the challenge statement is that we want to be able to reduce 5% energy usage by 2025 using the baseline, uh, baseline of FY 20, uh, 2022. Right? Honestly, we weren't sure how our colleagues would take it. Mm. But I'm happy to share that there were bust, there were ground up initiatives. And in fact, a lot of time we don't do what we do, what, what we think is right because we don't know about it. And through this 5% um, challenge, it created lots of conversations. Then colleagues started to uh, realize that, oh, you mean there is such thing as plug load? We didn't know it. Colleagues realized that, actually, I don't need such bright light. I don't need to switch on both switch, one suffice. So there are a lot of low hanging fruits. Today, one of the common uh, practice among our colleagues will be, by the end of the day, everybody will switch off their adapter, their, their plug, before they leave the office. And also because of this 5% challenge, suggestion to consolidate our CET programs. So in the evening, we run um, training program for adult learners. Currently, or in the past, the classes is held air in every school blocks because for the convenience. Yeah. But we said, hey, why did we do that? Why don't we consolidate the classes in some buildings? convenient to our CET adult learners and at the same time, it means that we can shut down the chillers of those unused buildings much earlier. Again, this will result in more saving. So really for us, it's beyond just uh, infrastructure and I hope I, I explained to you that 6030 vision is possible. We are also uh, wanting to change people's minds, uh, our self mindset. Because only when we become a model, role model to our students, would our sustainability claim be credible? Would our students want to go extra mile? And in fact, we are also involving our students. In, uh, in the coming semester, about 100 students uh, will go out to uh, uh, adopt four HDB blocks around the Dover areas they will reach out to the residents to share with them the ways to uh, live sustainably, uh, to cut down how they can reduce energy usage, water usage, so on and so forth. But let me come back to uh, how IHL, Institutes of Higher Learning, uh, may avoid the trap of greenwashing. Right? I trust that none of the education institutions would want to intentionally greenwash. But what might be some common uh, pitfall, I think, uh, as we share, is something for us to guard against ourselves as well, uh, is that we tend to use buzzword. Oh, we are green campus, we are eco campus. Uh, and when our actions do not sufficiently back us up. If we, were to, we, we, cannot tell, we cannot be going out and make statements like, Oh, we are green campus because we install solar panel. Mm. When we still have water bottle everywhere, where we just turn on our aircon at maybe 20 degrees, so on and so forth, right? Um, so think before we use adjectives. 
yeah, in, in our marketing materials. And as an education institution, um, again, if we claim that we are sus champion of sustainability, sustainable uh, living, have we, have we uh, incorporated sufficient uh, sustainability-related know-how or education into our curriculum, such that our students will graduate, will leave the place knowing how to be a um, responsible citizen for <coughs> a sustainable world. Right? Uh, I think increasingly people are scrutinizing. So it is even down to when we accept sponsorship or when we identify our partners, are these partners, um, agreeing partners, sustainable? Or are they those that, you know, oh, just selling fossil fuel? Mm. So, the, the, these are a few ways I think we have to um, look, you know, we have to look into uh, so as not to fall into this track. I don't know whether Devin, you have something else to, to advise. Thank you, Georgina. Yeah. Because uh, when we came in also, we noticed that uh, you, you are switched off the aircon. We all could feel that directly. And I'm sure Grand Force as well as KPM, you are very happy. Their advice is taken seriously and implemented. <laughs> we are very good. Okay, now uh, since we only left with three minutes less, so what I thought I will ask a little bit a more pointed question to Dennis. So Dennis, uh, you are not the only one talking about sustainable cities, green cities, smart cities, yes. like Master and many other cities yes. around the world. <laughs> Tell us why are you in better? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not saying <laughs> we're better. Uh, this is long-term development. Yeah. Our vision, there, are, there are three uh, vision, sustainability, smart city, and national identity. And we do the detail into eight principles. Yeah. When we, we do something, development, we have to have a principle and we have to have a KPI. In IKEA Nusantara, we have eight principles and uh, 24 KPI, let me check, yeah. which relate to your question, such as like uh, principle number three. We have what we call it, should the IKN Nusantara should be connected, connected, active, and accessible. Uh, and then we have three KPI, 80% all travel, using public transport or active mobility mode. And then we have KPI 10 minutes distance to essential facilities and transport hub. And less than 50 minutes to travel between Nusantara core area to the nearest airport by 2030. That is uh, principle number three and the three KPI. And related to the uh, sustainability, Principle number four, low carbon emission. We have three KPI, such as renewable energy source to fulfill 100% of the city energy needs, and 60% energy conservation from uh, building, and net zero emission target in Nusantara by 2045. So, I think any development such uh, like IKN Nusantara with a big and long term, we should basically agree and again back up with the regulation to make sure that this follow during the any development stage. Thank you, Dennis. I know as a president of Institution of Engineers in Indonesia, he has done his homework very well. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, well, I think we are left with less than a minute, but I think uh, we can't let uh, one of the big four, that is KPMG, go free. So KPMG, here is the question. Climate reporting is shifting towards accounting and legal framework, while the key is to measure and report in a highly technical engineering impact. Is there a disconnect in the system? It's a very good question with a very difficult answer. Um, <laughs> the reason is that finally we are seeing a lot more convergence in the way we are measuring, monitoring and reporting. 
and the kind of regulatory requirements which are coming up. So we do see a convergence happening. However, uh, majority of our projects when we start working on reporting, they end up <clears throat> in a situation where there isn't much information available. Even if the data is available, how trustworthy that data is, is something of a question mark. And we do have challenges in accessing real-time information almost every single place. And therefore, it is important that this convergence happens quickly so that a lot more time is actually spent on the corrective actions on the emissions rather than spending more time in collating data and then reporting in the formats and, uh, of the prescribed format. So it's very important that we have the mindset changing from uh, collecting information on a manual basis to having this information sent out from the equipment on a regular basis which can then be sampled and then re be reported with confidence. So that's very uh, important for the uh, environmental side of things. It is also important to have a social reporting structure uh, to be fortified. And this is also coming into play with third party uh, providers providing information on the social aspects of it. So thankfully, we are also seeing a lot more credible information which is coming in for various organizations and their activities from third parties. So more and more as we go ahead, we will see data providers and third party authenticating services as one of the areas which could uh, be much sought after. And we will also have to align with more and more changes coming on the regulatory side. So we had TCFD, we got a little used to it, or rather I should start with GRI. We had GRI, we got used to it. Then we have TCFD, we sort of got used to it. And then we have TNFD. And what I hear is now there is another uh, dis disclosure uh, framework, which may be in the works around um, di gender, diversity, and inclusion. So you have all these aspects increasing in terms of the kind of reporting that is required. So we really need to work towards moving away from the requirements of reg regulation and then reporting based on that to actually sincerely feel um, the need for collecting this information for self-improvement. Thank you, Devan. Georgina, we actually ran out of the time, but I don't want to leave you out. So do you have like a less than 10 second message? <laughs> Companies out there, uh, Singapore Poly is also a living lab. We encourage and we welcome you uh, to, come, to, to come and partner, partner with us uh, to showcase your technology, to share your programs with our full-time students, our part-time students, and to support our SMEs. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, the panel is getting better, so he needs 10 seconds. Please give him, yes. Since the IKN Santara is... Uh, uh, designed to play, uh, to invite the investor, technology, anything related to support the development of Nusantara. Uh, I'm very welcome if you need any information or anything to contact for that uh, requires. Thank In you. fact, it's a good <laughs> message. The reason I say is that Abigail will correct me. Uh, Singapore has more than 1,100 uh, family wealth offices and trillions of dollars waiting to be invested. So you, your, uh, your invitation is absolutely uh, timely. And uh, since uh, as a panel chair, I still have to wrap it up. But then since time is limited, I have to summarize everything in one line, which is basically uh, sustainability direction is emerging and you don't want to be left out. That's basically what the panelists are saying. So I agree with them. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Prof. Sriram and our panelists for those valuable contributions for today's discussion. And I'd like to invite you to please remain on stage. We do have some tokens to present to you as well. Now, please join me in inviting back on stage our panelists from the first panel, Ms. Abigail Ng, Mr. Lim Youngway, and Ms. Therese Norlander. Now, to present the token, I'd like to invite on stage President of IES, Mr. Dalson Chung.
It has been a morning of rich and insightful sharing by our esteemed panelists and moderator. And we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to the unwavering commitment and outstanding efforts to our cause. We'd like to invite Mr. Chung to give a first handshake to everybody and present a token of appreciation to our moderator, Prof. C. Ram Ramakrishna. Dr. Engineer Dana Sadayat Sumadilaga. Dr. Dave Chaya. Miss Georgina Poa. Miss Therese Norlander. Miss Abigail Ung. And Mr. Lim Young Wei. All right, let's come. Let's step forward for a group photograph. Please step forward. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's give them another big round of applause. Thank you all, you may return to your seats. Thank you for being such an integral part of today's success. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we have come to the end of this morning's program. Now, we'd like to express our appreciation to everyone for attending, including all of you who are joining us online. We hope you've enjoyed the lecture and discussions. Now, for those of you who are interested to access resources of the event and view the recordings of today, do keep a lookout for updates on the event website, www.charlesrand.com. Now, please remain seated as we invite our distinguished guests to take their leave first. Now, as our distinguished guests make their leave, uh, just a friendly reminder for those of you who are tracking your attendance for CPD points. Now, don't forget to clock out by completing the post-event survey. Now, I'd also like to invite the rest of our audience here today to take a moment to scan the QR code provided on the screen and share your feedback with us. Your insights will be valuable as we strive to improve and enhance our future events. All right, and for those of you who have registered for the learning journeys, now please take note of the information on the screen. Now, we've arranged ushers to guide you to your respective venues. Departures from the Singapore Poly Convention Center, SPCC, will begin promptly at 1.50 p.m. Now, for those of you who have successfully registered for the Rolls-Royce technical visit, please note the bus will be departing at 1.30 p.m. Please proceed to the pickup point outside SPCC. Once again, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, We Her Holdings, and many of our supporting partners for making this event possible. Okay, thank you all for waiting. I think at this time, I'd like to invite all our participants to proceed to the SPCC foyer to enjoy your lunch. Until we meet again next year, take care and stay well. Have a great day ahead.